Hi there, welcome, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Jason Shoulder, and this is Learning to Fail. People are complicated, and I know a lot of complicated people. My guest today is comedian Sean Patton. I had the good fortune of hosting his show in Asheville the night before we recorded this. It was awesome. Interviewing Sean was as fascinating as it was surreal. I've been around some smart people in my life, but this was the first time I felt like I was in the room with genius. Before we roll today's interview, I want to say how grateful I am to everyone who has subscribed to Learning to Fail and downloaded the episodes currently available. Numerous people have written to say they felt like they were right in the room with us. That is precisely the way I want these conversations to feel. I still marvel at the fact that people are willing to take time out of their lives to talk to me, much less listen. The fact that so many of you have been motivated to take the additional step of writing to me is truly humbling. So thank you. I will do everything in my power to keep bringing you an experience that is at once personal and engaging. Learning to Fail podcast is my avenue for expanding the way I think and the things I think about. If you like what you hear, please tell your friends about Learning to Fail and encourage them to tell theirs. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes and check out our website for additional information about each of the people we interview. While you're there, please visit our Donate and Amazon pages. Each page will give you clear instructions on what to do. For the time being, we are a completely donation-based podcast, so all of our episodes are being brought to you by you. Our donation page will allow you to make one-time or recurring donations. Our Amazon portal enables you to support the podcast without spending any extra money of your own. Please bookmark our Amazon page and start your shopping there every time you visit or buy anything on Amazon. The most helpful thing you can do is simply to listen to the podcast and encourage others to do the same. The world will be a better place when we can all start learning to fail together. Let's dive into my talk with international touring comedian, Sean Patton. What kind of dog you got? Uh, I have a Legato Romagnolo. It's this Italian hunting dog. Okay. Yeah, yeah I know. It's crazy. Yeah. It's like this vanity dog that cost thousands of dollars, and I rescued it from a family that had three kids and just couldn't keep the dog anymore. Say it again. So it's but, just very, like, the, the, the dog only exists in three countries, in yeah. Italy, the U.K., well, now the U.S., and Australia. All right. That's pretty much the only places you can find these dogs. And... It's this Italian breed that goes back 600 years. It's probably the oldest known purebred dog. Yeah. And a friend of mine got one in Finland, and she was putting it on Facebook and stuff. And it's like, I got this awesome dog. Or, you know, I'm so excited. I'm getting this puppy. I was like, oh, my God, I want one of these things. So um, I found a breeder in the U.S., and I said, you know, can I adopt one of these dogs? <laughs> Is there ever a rescue? She's like, dude, these dogs are not available for rescue. They're, yeah, yeah. They're $3,000 a puppy, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, she, she said, I'll, you know, I'll put you on the list. And I said, well, put me pretty far down on the list. <laughs> it's going to be a while before I have three grand to spend on a dog. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then a couple years later, she emailed me and said, you know, uh, we have a rescue possibility for one of these dogs if you want it. Someone. So it was like a family that won the lottery. Well, got themselves an Italian hunting dog. Well, actually, they're, they're so like, her, hmm. it's a family. They're there. I guess that, you know, they're a little well off. They have they have money. Not a, They're not rich or obnoxious, but they have some money. And the parents bought these dogs and bought one in Australia and then bred it with one who was uh. here already. And so, and gave the puppies to their own kids, right? So, the people I got it from, they didn't buy this dog. Right. They bred their parent dog. They sired the male with a female and the deal was they would split the litter. Oh, and then and so so they've had this dog for eight years, and they have three kids now, and they just can't take care of her. She's really demanding, and uh, oh yeah, well you yeah. know she's like where's they, she now? She's in the truck. She just she's a little um, right now she's sick, so she'd have to be in the crate, 
And Wait, in the truck? In the back of the truck. Yeah. That we were just in? They were just There's in a there. dog in there? There's a dog in there, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, she's riding in the back. And she's just cool, like, hanging out? Uh, she hates it back there, but I've never met a dog that hates the back of a truck. She's the first one. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, she's fine. I mean, oh, in the bed where part. she needs to be. Yeah. yeah, she's in the back. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, no, there's... she was in the back seat, and you hadn't noticed. That would have been there, there's something. ventilation. That would have been a dead dog in the yeah, 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 yeah. And if there's ventilation, she's fine. She's she's not gonna die back there. Oh, that's I had no. Yep, there's North Carolina for you. There's a dog somewhere. Yeah, I just this morning I actually just uh, wrote a joke about it. It's like if your neighbors, if you live in the South and your neighbors approve of how you discipline your dog, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and specifically wrong. Yeah, like yeah. not not like oh, you gotta go a little harder. Yeah, yeah, no, right. That's you're, mm -hmm. you're probably already being hard enough. So, it's it's funny what I. That's what's so interesting about this state. There are, there are so many awesome cities, with the exception of Charlotte. Um, <laughs> I mean, Charlotte. Charlotte's just like the most. It's just a whitewashed city. You know, it's just yeah. like. A, and maybe I'm biased. Maybe I just haven't been there enough. But I, every time I go, I just feel like it's like. Why don't you just call this Bank of America City? Right. You know, it is what it feels like. Yeah, it's you know, true. It's really what it is, and. But I, as far as – but it does have what I think is the best airport in the country. Oh, really? The most why, efficient. Why you... It's just the way it's laid out. Oh. The Charlotte Airport is laid out how every single airport should be laid out. Like the terminals aren't far from each other, but they're clearly separate, and there's a giant food court situation in the middle, and it just makes sense as yeah, an airport. Yeah, that's true. You know? It just seems like I'm always going from Terminal E, which is the farthest – yeah. And it's like, because cause when you are when you live in Asheville, you do a little puddle you, jumper from You Charlotte take that little puddle often. jumper. Oh, yeah, I've been on it. Yeah, and so that's like, they keep those planes really far away from all the oh. other planes. Yeah. And normally I'm coming from somewhere far away, you know? So right. I'm on a big plane that lands in terminal, at the end of Terminal C, and then I got to walk like a pretty solid mile through that airport to get to the little plane that's... But now you're getting exercise, see? I don't and mind that's getting part exercise. Part of the design. <laughs> I don't mind getting exercise. Yeah. But the connection is seldom very long. Is like, there wait, is there a uh, any direct flight to Asheville? Well, here's the thing. You can fly nonstop from Asheville to a lot of places unless that's your destination. So like mm. I flew to Japan from Asheville and I had one stop in Chicago. But if I fly to Chicago from Asheville, they're routing me through Newark. Yeah, well, you know, there's that. I can't remember what the website's called. I've done it once. Then they don't like it when you do it, but uh, airlines don't. But it's where you do exactly what you just said, where like you're looking for flights where you're gonna get off. Oh, right, halfway at the yeah at the connection. You're willing to pay a little bit more, but it's it, it's more for like if you're in a bind and you're like, I need to fucking get to Chicago quicker and today. Right. But if I take any flight, like you said, I got to go Atlanta to fucking Dallas. <laughs> right. You know, like, yeah. I remember when I, yeah, like, that's, it's almost like you wonder why they even build airports in some of these smaller towns where it's like, just have a shuttle or something. Yeah, shit, right. You know? Like, yeah. Don't make me, because I, I love Colorado and I, uh, I've never, I've never taken a puddle jumper flight into any of the mountain cities. I always land in Denver and drive into the Rockies. Right. But I've heard stories and I, and from people who like just live in the, they're like, yeah, it's, one of the more terrifying experiences you'll ever have is taking a puddle jumper into the Rockies. Oh yeah, because I, it's it's lower altitude, and at that low altitude, you are being shaken. Yeah, just accept it. Yeah, you're not going to have a smooth flight, and it's then it's like, why even build it then? Why not just? You know, why, well, because why not train? Because it sounds like Aspen and Steamboat, yeah. and you know where rich people live, mm -hmm. and they don't want to. Take a four-hour train ride. I don't want a beautiful ride through the mountains. I want to be there. Yeah, well, man, yeah. I remember landing in Aspen and being like, I mean, we were hugging those mountains to get to that airport. It oh, is yeah. crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Aspen's nice. I love the I love the Rockies. I love, I, that's why I love it up here. I love mountainous towns. My issue with Colorado is that it's landlocked, and I've never lived in a landlocked state. Oh, okay. So it, it, I don't know what it is, man. It's it's a It's a weird... I find landlocked states to be bizarre places. I hadn't thought about that. I something grew up, about it, you know. No, you're right. I mean, when you say it, I can feel it. It's like mm -hmm. there's there's something you're you're too far from connectivity to other parts of the world, and just so, like yeah. and the mindset kind of yeah. rallies around that. Yeah, there's definitely something to that. Yeah. I I uh, I grew up. I mean, I've been in a lot of places, but I grew up in New Mexico for five years, from nine to fourteen. And that talk about landlocked. Yeah. Yeah. And culturally landlocked too. I mean, I was in Santa Fe before Santa Fe became Santa Fe. Is it what? What is that? Is Santa Fe? 
I can New Mexico is one of three states I've never been to. Oh, really? Yeah. New Mexico oh. is one. They have a new comedy club in Albuquerque, man. I mean, I'm surprised. Uh... Is Albuquerque a good town, though? Well, <laughs> not to people who are from Santa Fe. You know, Albuquerque is the town that we drove to to fly, I to fly out of. You know, that for, for us, Al Albuquerque was an airport. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, Albuquerque is sprawling. It's got the University of New Mexico, which is a good school for some things. Although, yeah. you know, the people in Santa Fe called it University Near Mom. Because, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> UNM was their yeah, uh, yeah. initials. And so... Albuquerque, I mean, you know, I, in some ways, Albuquerque is not that different from Charlotte, but it's got a lot more gangs. Um, yeah, it's I guess I can't say that for sure. I don't know what the gang scene is like in Charlotte, but but oh, the gang scene in Charlotte. I wish I had some insight into that. Like, <laughs> let me break it down for you. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. Um, but in in New Mexico, it's pretty it's it's pretty dark, man. I mean, yeah, I grew up there as a minority, as a white guy. Yeah, you yeah. know, and and with a pretty aggressive majority like you know the hispanics and they prefer to be called hispanic they don't consider themselves mexican or latino because right. they're, they're descendants from spain so you know they are not happy about the oh, wow. large influx of of white people and yeah i don't blame them i get it yeah, but yeah. but i mean it was uncomfortable growing up there for sure yeah you know and then Cali then california I was in New Mexico for like five years. Then I went to boarding school in Colorado, and then I went to California for college. Ah. And I knew after being in Colorado, after being in New Mexico, then Colorado, I was like, I want to be in California. Oh, sure. That was very clear to me. Yeah. So California. I mean, if California weren't full of so many fucking dipshits, it'd be one of the greatest places on earth. I like California. I don't. I'm not a California hater or a West Coast. Uh, I don't subscribe to that like one coast is better than the other i just prefer the east coast mentality to the west coast mentality yeah i just really do which is fucked though because like i was saying so many great so many great cities in north carolina and so much so many great people and it's a really a beautiful amazing state but the legislature is completely fucked oh you yeah. know what i'm saying like so that at, so like you add that to like when I say, oh, I love the East Coast mentality, then you could easily point out. So you don't think gays should get married or be able to? I don't think North Carolina yeah, it's like, is fuck. what people mean when they say East Coast mentality. Yeah, I know, I know. Everybody, everybody equates it to like the New York. Yeah, East Coast. When, when people say East Coast, East Coast I think they mean New York, yeah. Massachusetts, really New York. Uh, that's but, but I, that's the thing. I like I love the East Coast because you, here's the thing: the West Coast is very homogenized. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. From fucking Seattle to San Diego, it's like there's it's like almost like it's one type of person, and a lot of them are great. But there is that like, and I talk about it on stage. But the people who are so politically correct that they're actually conservative again. Yeah, I love that whole bit. That well, you thank did. you. Is thank that you. new or is that newer? Yeah, okay, I, yeah. I, but like, it's true. Like there is this like West Coast sort of like, you know, politically correct, make every effort not to offend someone. And in some cases, by not even being a human, like not even acknowledging and being a, like, you find people out there will act, act like they're offended. And I mean that because there are people who, they, you, you, there's something that's like, you can't possibly truly be offended by what was just said. Right. You're acting like you're offended. So other people can see you, quote unquote, being offended and be like, oh, he's politically correct or right. she's politically correct. Good for them. Uh, you're you're doing it for the fucking aesthetic of being in public, because there's I've I've heard conversations where people get offended and it's like, are you fucking kidding me? He guess what? His friend is a black person. Why is that offensive? Right. You go, oh my friend, he's a black guy, or like, oh you mean are you talking about the is are they Asian? It's like, oh why do they have to be Asian? Because their last name's Lee. Well, no, I thought I knew I thought I knew a guy named Jared Lee. And he's an Asian guy. Are we talking about two different guys? And if I did say, oh, Lee, is he Asian? Why does he have to be Asian? Because Lee's a very fucking popular last name in, in, the, Asia. in Asia. Yeah. In, in, in the Ch in Chinese people specifically. How about that? How about I just differentiated Asian people for you there, PC warrior? But, like, there is this mentality on the West Coast that I think is more harmful than it is helpful. That you're like, you're, you're, you're okay, yeah, maybe people aren't, 
are less likely to drop racial slurs out there. Sure, that's a good one. But then it goes a step further where now you're just stripping people of their individuality and their cultures. Mm. Like by not acknowledging that someone's black, you're not acknowledging everything they've been through, who they are, how they've come to be who they are, what their personality revolves around. You're just being like, no, we're all people. No, you're not. You grew up in fucking Mar Marin County and they grew up in Oakland. You're different people. Right. You have to acknowledge who they are. What there's, you know, you have to don't discriminate. There's a, racism is all about discrimination. That's the problem. Right. And people throw racism around when half the time it's just about acknowledging race. It's like I'm acknowledging that we're different. That's not a bad thing. Being different is not a bad thing. I'm not discriminating. Right. I'm acknowledging. That's the West and I feel like the West Coast, the lines get blurred there and it's dangerous. It's fucking dangerous because like I said, then you're trying, you know, homogenization and it's all, now you're saying we're all one color, one person, much like a certain Eastern European country tried to do right last century, you know, and destroy all the others. But like on the East Coast, I feel like you do have a little bit more honesty in that realm. Well, yes, the problem there is places like Florida or, you know, certain parts of the Carolina, or certain parts of Georgia, where you're going to hear people who are flat out racist. But then you're going to travel north to New York and you're going to, you know, it's going to be a lot more open minded. And then but then all the cities around New York, like Boston and Philly, sort of have a reputation for having a little more racism. Right. But they also have a little more honesty to it, too. You know, well, I think there's the difference if I hear you correctly, mm -hmm. between you know racial differentiation and mm -hmm. racial discrimination. 100%. Yeah. There's a firm difference, and racial differentiation is not a negative thing. And I don't know, I don't think anyone, it's not, it, like, okay, it's, it's negative if you like try to, all right, well, I'm white, I stay over here, you're black, you stay over there. That's bad. But that's, but that's, that's in the direction of right. yeah, that's segregation, yeah. and that has its kind exactly. of, that's leaning in the racism, the, the discrimination right. direction. That's a yeah. terror. But but if leaning pretty hard, by the right, way, right, right, yeah. But like, but if you know, if uh, to a black guy and a white guy sitting in a room discussing what it's like to be black and what it's like to grow up white and how different they are, that's there's nothing. It's not a racist conversation. Right. It's just fucking. We're different. Yeah. We grew up in different, you grew up in San Diego. I grew up in fucking Sacramento. You grew up, you're, you know, you grew up in a black neighborhood. I grew up in a white neighborhood. I, I'm just saying royal eye. Yeah. I, I didn't, I grew up, but, that, but that's also coming from the South. Like Louisiana's fucked, but New Orleans is amazing. Right. Right. So like New Orleans is a very like, you know, culturally vibrant place. You get an hour outside of it and it's like, what happened? Yeah. What happened out here? Jesus. But like. For us, it was always very like, it wasn't considered a bad thing to acknowledge that your black friend was a black guy or vice versa. Right. But then people I know who've come and visited New Orleans get very turned off by that. Very turned off by the sort of racial honesty that there is there. And yes, of course, there's some terrible, terrible, it's the South, you know, it was, there were slaves there, you know, it's an awful, there's some awful history, but New Orleans was also the first free black city. It was the first mm. first city in America where slaves could buy their freedom and live freely in oh, the Treme. That. that was a neighborhood, the Treme. Okay. Um, Storyville, where Louis Armstrong ended up growing up, you know? But, like, I mean, I'm not trying, I mean, but I'm not defending all of the horrific shit that came before that. Yeah, I don't think you anyone's going to hear no. it that way. But, like, I just feel like we can't pretend like there aren't differences that we need to acknowledge, embrace, and bask in. And I'm not saying by, but I think so many people, it's such a tender thing or such a fine line. So many people are afraid that embracing it or acknowledging it will immediately lead to discrimination. And I'm saying it doesn't, it doesn't have to at all. I'm saying embracing and acknowledging it will more than likely lead to acceptance right. and reverence. And then the melding begins. Whereas what we what you got in some places, it's like, I don't know, this just feels like whitewashing. That's what it feels like. It feels like you don't you're uncomfortable with the fact that you're white and our race has done so much damage that you're now trying to ignore all of that and pretend like it's like. Oh no 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 no! I'm I'm the good guy, and I won't even acknowledge your your. I won't acknowledge any difference from me 
between us and I think no one else should. And it's like, that's not healthy. That's right. you're just that's right. not healthy. Anyway, that's that's why I prefer the East Coast mentality <laughs> because you get the good and the bad with the East Coast. Whereas in the West Coast, a lot of people just pretending like everything's OK. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, it is White very specifically, you know, very honest on the East Coast. I mean, and again, we're talking mm -hmm. New York. I mean, it's like specifically New yeah, York. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I'm originally from New York, so my first nine years were spent there, and I was. Oh, really? Yeah, my first You're two years. Mover. You moved around. Yeah, yeah. I, You're I, a I, nomad. I well, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I've got a complicated story, not overly complicated, but I mean, you know, I, um, but we, I was born in the city. We lived there for a couple of years, and then moved out to Westchester. Uh, okay. Um, and I was there till I was nine. Uh, but my dad worked in the city, and he, um, so I would go into the city somewhat regularly. I mean, it, the city was a part of my life, but I sure. can't claim to be like you know. I'm not a New York City boy. Like I know people who grew up in the city; they're very different. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then when I was nine, we moved out to New Mexico, and I remember my first year um, in school. This one kid uh, named Joe Zamara. He was he was like the quiet bully. He wasn't mean to people, but he was known to be the toughest kid in the class. Sure, but he wasn't. But he didn't. He didn't exercise that unless he needed to. And he referred to me as the native New Yorker. Like that was an insult. Ah, uh, okay. like that was he. He was like, oh, there's the native New Yorker. You know, like. Yeah, right. That's that's very descriptive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That is what I am. <laughs> I am a native New Yorker. I was like, I don't understand why that's a problem. But uh, so anyway, yeah. So I was there for a while, and and then New Mexico, and then Colorado, and then California, and then here with some Europe and stuff in between. But <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, and then it's just gonna keep going, and then some time in Argentina, and then you oh, know. I did. I lived in Ecuador for six months. I mean, did I, you? I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, well, here's the thing. If I don't talk about that the right way, it sounds like I'm a dick. You know, I'm like, I'm not trying to like list these places I've lived or been. I mean, I've I've invested a lot of time and energy in a lot of different. You parts do, of the you world. do have you do have what I call the cultured white man voice. <laughs> do you know okay. what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you like tonally, your voice is like not an aggressive, harsh voice, but it's not like soft and delicate either. It's very just like, it's like a it's like a it's like a lake. It's like very. It's a it's lake. Like, it's like a lake. It's like a. It's like a calm, smooth lake, body of water. You know, it can get rough. It can get rough. You know, it can also be cool, smooth. It can be cold. It can be hot. But it's overall just sort of very calm. That's funny. Calm lake, and you, uh, and like the depth, the di the deepness of you're not. You don't speak. You don't have too deep of a voice. You're not too. You're not too light of a voice. You have sort of like the right in the middle, like a calm wind. <laughs> like a calm wind. You've read books. You've drank wines. You know? <laughs> You've spoke how many languages do you speak? Uh fluently. Fluently. Uh okay. So well, right I mean, there right there, the fact that the, you that, that I asked that fluently. question, that's <laughs> that, that's very indicative. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so do I still need to answer the question? Yeah, I would like to know though. Yeah. So I speak Spanish pretty fluently. I mean, yeah. I would say I mean fluent's a strong word, but very conversationally. Like I can speak Spanish all day, all week, no problem. Do you do you speak like a like can you go to different like different dialects of spanish like do you think well, you... they can understand me yeah uh i have i can i'll tell you what i can do i can tell people's accents when they speak in their language like i can tell ah. where they're speaking spanish from not exactly but with more accuracy than you'd think for a white dude like yeah because you know cubans speak a certain way and... well really quickly um just uh, two years ago my best friend's bachelor party we went to cuba Oh really? Yeah, uh, and he's fluent, fluent, super fluent in Spanish, but like the king's Spanish. Like right. his, he's his mom's his mom's from Madrid, Madrid. His dad's from Iraq, but he spent every summer in Madrid, and grew up in Louisiana. But like, uh, but so Spanish is he's been to Spain dozens of times. He speaks fluent Spanish, but we get to Cuba, and he's the only one of us who's fluent enough to communicate. And whenever he would be talking to Cubans for a long period of times, he, he would laugh a lot. And like to us in English, be like it's seriously just like talking to someone from Boston, like it's such a specific yeah, it accent, is. where it's such a specific accent that I've never really heard. So it's like imagine talking to a fucking guy right now who's like, "Where you fucking cocksuck is from?" You know, it's like it's just funny. <laughs> it's just funny speaking Spanish, hearing this accent. Like yeah, apparently Cuba is the Boston it's, accent. It's the Boston of Spanish, Spanish accents. Accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> apparently, which I find hilarious. But yeah, they do speak a specific yeah, dialect. Yeah, a very yeah. specific dialect. And uh, and when I was in Ecuador, they speak in Quito, um, which is the capital. They speak 
sort of the the high one of the highest Spanishes. You know, like mm. it's a good place to go learn Spanish. Okay. But then when you go down to the coast in Guayaquil, which you almost never do because it's dangerous as fuck, but if you go down to the coast, you can barely understand them. You know, and that's true. Like in a lot of coastal Spanish-speaking places, they drop the s's and the and they change the, they pronounce words very differently, and a lot of words are run together. Yeah, and and that's true for Cuba too. Except Cuba's like really rapid fire and just kind of got its own, got its own thing. Uh, but it's really hard to understand people from the coast when you're a Spanish as a second language person. Of like, course, yeah. and, and they're so fast. You know, they speak yeah. so quickly. So yeah, it's it's very hard. I mean, I, I I was I I can't quite say I dated her, but I was. Almost dating this woman when I was in Ecuador, and she was. Uh, her How father, long were we in Ecuador? I was there for six months. Okay. Yeah, nice I was there in chunk. college. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was there. I lived with the family and stuff. Like, oh, cool. I went down there with high school Spanish, and I came back with the Spanish. I Wait, in Ecuador, have. I'm like I'm, I'm trying to mental map it. That's Central America, right? No, no, no it's South America, South America, but it's the northern northwestern it's, coast, it, right? Uh, northwestern coast, yeah, because yeah, okay, they have okay. the Galapagos Islands, which are right. Yeah. Okay, bam, yeah. got it. Yep. Um, yeah, I wanna. I'm like obsessed. I really want to go to Argentina. Mm. Um, Buenos Aires. Well, here's what's interesting. And maybe you've heard this too. But I met, this was a couple of years ago. I met this dude named Arnie, A-R-N-E. Um, he said that was his real name, Ar Arnie. And I was like, is it Arnie? He's like, no, it's Arnie. <laughs> but he was a he was an Argentinian dude. But he was fucking full-on ginger. Like, full-on red hair. Right. Like, like, he looked like just a redhead. And he approached me after a show to say like, said nice things. And when he when a when a Spanish accent came out of his fucking red headed face, I was like, "You're the most interesting person I've met today. <laughs> Let's have a drink." But he was like, "Yeah, man." He's like, "There's a lot, a ton of redheads in Argentina because of all the fucking Nazis, right? That fled Germany after the war. They all went to South America. Right. They all somehow ended up in Argentina. Yeah. And apparently, according to him." I don't know if he was bullshitting me because he was sort of a whimsical. So he was one of these guys who, like, one minute he said he was traveling for school, and then like after a couple of drinks he said he was a poet, you know, right. researching. So, maybe so he, he was really. He CIA. had like a couple of different like, <laughs> it, but never, nothing ever too con contradicting. Right. But he had like he seemed like one of these guys where it's like you might be here with like a wife and kids, and they think you're out seeing a movie with friends or something. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but he but he said that like. Argentina, like a lot of South American countries at the time, was just sort of poor and sort of like, you know, living check to check, basically, the entire country until all these Germans got there and started kind of integrating themselves into the system and bringing with them that German mentality of like efficiency and structure. Yeah, that could be. And which is why now Argentina is like top of the. Like of the of South America, it's like the 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 most the country that's at at the top. Yeah, well, basically. And I think the British had some islands. weren't the Falkland Islands? Wasn't that part of Argentina? I think so. Yeah. So it's just, it's just it's just a weird, interesting thing of like how life. I say this all the fucking time, but it's really true. How the best author in life is life itself, because if that's what it really happened, if Nazi Germany, awful thing. The war ends, Nazis flee, end up in what is a poor, rundown country full right. of crime and murder, and start integrating themselves into it and bring with that a sense of structure, efficiency, and now it's extremely low in crime with a great high economy and apparently an amazing place to raise a family if you live in South America. Mm. Isn't that fucking crazy? Well, I think if the, you know what I mean? if How, the like, Nazis had succeeded, yeah. I think Germany would have been very low in crime once they'd wiped out everybody they didn't want. Well, sure. I mean, Germany right now is pretty yeah. low. Germany right now, that's what's amazing about Germany right now. They're doing everything right. Yeah. They, you know what yeah. I mean? They're like, Syrian refugees, get in here. Yeah. Free health care, have it. Are you an artist? How about have a grant? Oh, yeah, totally. Don't I, pay rent for two years. I almost went to art school in Germany. Yeah. I, I met with the- Jazz musicians, get over here. <laughs> You know, they don't like you in the States. Get over here. We love you in Berlin. Yeah, well, Berlin. Yeah. Berlin is not Germany. Yeah, it's exactly. in Germany. It's in Germany, yeah. It's, but it's, it's, Berlin's a world Berlin country, is yeah. really its own place. I, I I lived in Berlin for six months. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love how anywhere, I'm just going to start bringing up places now. It's like, so Antarctica. Like, well, you know, I spent a year. I have not spent any time in Antarctica. Wrote, wrote a novel. Uh, but I'm a, my, my, I have a ghostwriter name. It's uh, Stephen Hawking. 
<laughs> my 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 time in Berlin was spent on a construction site, you know, building, putting ah. you know, like refitting old doors into old buildings, and with none of the tools that would have made it easy. You know, I I left there with a real understanding for how valuable it is to have the right tool. That's what I learned more than anything in six months because we just didn't. We were yeah. everything was just like bullshitting our way through all of it, and and I worked with these. Uh, one guy was South African, the other guy was British, and the South African guy was kind of the boss. And see the Africa, and he would he would just be like, everything was fucked. Fuck was a word that described everything. He's like, Jason, you see this fucking thing? Just fuck it off, man. Just fuck it right the fuck off, okay? <laughs> How much? Just just the fuck, just <laughs> fuck, just fuck that fuck right the fuck off, just right fuck there, the and then sting fuck and then it up it on the bit. fucking hinges, you know? And yeah. it was like literally there were. More fucks than all other words combined in any given sentence with this guy. But he had a point, you know, that he was trying to make yeah. out of just how he communicated yeah. it. Oh, yeah. So, uh, That's what's funny about going to the UK is how, like, how just, I mean, this is common knowledge, but how freewheelingly they throw cunt around. Yeah. And it's really like, but to them, it's their fuck. Yeah, it's a different word. Because they hear yeah. fuck as much as Americans use it, and they're like, Jesus. Yeah, what? <laughs> you guys say fuck a lot. Yeah. But, like, they just, ah, the cunt. Oh, what a good cunt. And it's like an all, it's like cunt is there. Forget about it. It can mean anything. <laughs> you know, it can be an adjective. It could be an it's adverb. It's the Boston accent. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a, what a, oh, he's a good cunt. Oh, can you believe that cunt? And you're like, wait, but you just said, oh, so he's a good cunt. And then that person's just a cunt. Yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that bunch of cunts over there, good or bad. Oh, great cunts. <laughs> it could be all different types of cunts. You know what I mean? They're like Smurfs. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just a bunch of different kind of cunts. Oh. Um, Mm. So, what were you doing over there? Did you do Edinburgh or uh, Edinburgh? Edinburgh, sorry, yeah. Edinburgh. I knew as it came out of my mouth, I was saying. No, it you know what's funny is the I uh, I was so self conscious about whenever I brought up around people who've been about saying Edinburgh that I went too far the other way, and I would say Edinburgh. I would try and <laughs> pronounce it like a Scottish, and people were like it's Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh. It's really not that hard. Edinburgh, yeah. Scott, I've I've never no I've, I've I'm doing Edinburgh this year, 2017. Okay. Um, I've been to Scotland. I did the Glasgow Comedy Fest, and I fucking loved it so much. I love Scotland so much. I love the UK. I mean, I really do. I mean, I know they got a lot of shit going on there as well. But like, I just it's a different vibe performing over there, and I like it. I really like it. Like, they're just smarter. They're just better educated, more tolerant, more open minded. They just listen. They'll listen a little longer. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not. Ex That's what I kind of. American comedy is definitely like, America is like. You know, are you a football fan? No. No. Oh. Okay, I was trying to. I was gonna make. That's a good, okay. I can I probably make still a handle an analogy. analogy. I'm cultured enough, white male, to understand a football analogy. Uh, it it would be like like if uh, if if America if the American comedy scene was a current NFL quarterback, it would be like Tom Brady. Okay. Like it's the best, right? It's the but fucking it the ball. Well, you know, there's, it's done a couple <laughs> of shady things. It's done a couple of shady things, and it will probably do a couple more. But its track record is it's one of the fucking best. And then that would mean like the so then the UK comedy scenes like Aaron Rodgers, right? No, no idea. Like the Green Bay Packers. Okay. It's like amazing, not as decorated, not as technically great, but still great. Right. See what I'm saying? Um, right behind, and, and the UK comedy scene is awesome. Um, the, the, but the thing is, and I say this, and it's fucking weird. So many people out, but I'll, I'll explain myself. Is being, I don't think your operative, uh, your your number one operative on stage should be killing. I don't think killing is the end all, be all, or tell of how funny something truly is, because I believe being funny and killing are two different things, and being funny is infinitely harder. But it doesn't always mean it's going to kill in the moment, right? Right? Killing isn't that difficult. Killing, you go by the fucking play by the rules, like follow the numbers. You could kill a monkey, you know, beating a snare drum and then you know pooping on a, uh, uh, just taking a dump on in a bowl, and you know serving it to the audience and kill. Right? You know, I mean, it'd be gross, but it'd kill. You know, <laughs> I mean, you get, yeah, it you would get, be a little gross. Get like a like like, like seriously, like, kill like. You, that's why, like, some of the lowest common denominator shit just murders. Like, someone, a, a clown getting on, a gay clown would murder. You know what I mean? Right. Would crush on stage. But being funny sometimes takes a minute for people to really wrap their head around. Right. right? 
But killing should be a side effect of that. I look at it like this. When you go out drinking, your 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 motive, your number one motive shouldn't be getting wasted. It you, you should go out drinking to have a good time, to have some to enjoy conversation with friends, to crack some jokes with a bartender, to maybe meet another person and get laid, but to have a crazy memorable night. And if you happen to get wasted in the process, great. Right. Right? But if you just go out and just pound a bunch of fucking shots and just keep doing that till you're wasted, that's easy. Anyone can do that. That's how I look at it with comedy. If you really if your only operative is to get on stage and just crush, you can do that. You fucking follow the lines. Like, oh, let's talk about the basics. Dating. My child. Um, sex is weird. Um, how, huh? What what cars that drive themselves? Right. Well, huh? What well, what would Miss Driving Miss Daisy be like? You know? <laughs> I mean, just that's actually kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> that was all right. But you there's you know, like you if you watch like I see it all the time where it's like comedians who get on stage and they fucking destroy the room, but then you ask any audience member, like, hey, what did they say? Right. Rec rec recant one bit from like the next day. Right. Tell me one bit. Most of the time, I don't know. They were just funny. And that's great now. But like truly being funny is going out, drinking, having a good time. And if it happens to kill, just like then it happens to kill. And that's what you want. I mean, that's a good feeling. Right. But like, so that's what I like about it. Sometimes some of the sometimes you're doing clubs or shows in the in the US and you're faced with an audience who doesn't have an attention span. Hmm. So they're expecting a joke every 30 seconds. Right. And you know, there are comedians who are very good at that and I, you know, pre one-liners and great joke 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 great. Um they get up there and they they just bam 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 and I appreciate that, but I prefer a little more, right? And that's what you can kind of get away with a lot easier in the in the UK is they have an attention span. They'll listen. They'll let you build something in front of them for the payoff. You know what I mean? And that happens here in the U.S., of course, like last night. I was going to say, that's yeah. totally you. I mean, Last you... night. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, but, you know, like the, this Asheville, great city. You know, New York City, I can get away with that. But then, you know, certain, when you get to like some clubs that you just – I don't like that. I don't I like I don't like getting on stage at the you know the Fort Lauderdale Improv or the fucking the 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 the, the improv in Arlington, Texas or the you know I'm trying to think of the worst clubs I've done. A lot of them are in Texas. <laughs> I um, like how you're totally Hyenas up. in Texas, all of them are shit. The one in Dallas is all right, but the one in Fort Worth was terrible. But like the, for that one, for example, the, the club owner, who's not a bad guy, he just has a bad idea of how to run a club, if you ask me. He, like, between the headliner, featured headliner, he brings up people, whoever's birthday it is in the crowd, and they do blowjob shots on stage. That just crushes the, any Every club, it should be about the comedy first right. and the audience second, always. Right. That's why the, the best comedy club in the United States is called Acme Comedy Club. Right shortly behind it is a club called um, Ma uh, Comedy on State in Madison. Okay. But I know that's in the Midwest. I think the Midwest has one of the better senses of humor of anywhere in the country because they're cold weather kids. They spend most of their lives indoors. Hmm. They're forced to absorb things and develop personalities. Right. So I think they're just they have a great sense of humor there. But both of those clubs operate under the like, it's about the show and it's about the performer. Their happiness comes far before any audience member. They'll fucking toss an audience member like that. Mm -hmm. They police the crowds like that. They don't serve food in the showrooms so people aren't shoveling food down their fucking face while also supposed to be laughing and reacting and right. paying attention to the performer. They're not. They're looking at their goddamn nachos or their tacos, you know? But they don't do that at Acme or at Comedy on State, and they make it about you, the performer, so that way it leads into a, like, like Acme, the owner, his name's Lewis Lee, he once broke down his theory of comedy to me over dinner, and I got misty-eyed. Like, I swear to God, it like, I got choked up, because it was like, everyone needs to hear this. But it, it was like, a, it was like, listen, it was like, what was it? Always, but it was Can like, it was, it? in a nutshell, it was, I bring people who make me laugh. I believe in my sense of humor. 
and I bring people who I think are funny. And I make sure that they are taken care of and that they are having a great time so that they make sure my audience is taken care of and has a great time. And it's a circle of life that feeds itself, right? And I never, ever break that. He's like, I will never book anyone who I don't think is funny. I will never book anyone to sell tickets. I will only book people who I think are hilarious, and I will give them the right stage, the right atmosphere, so that my audience, even if they've never heard of that comedian, knows when they set foot in my club, as long as they trust me and my rules, they will see something great. Right. And I mean, it's way more intricate than that, but like that, that's no, but a that's, nutshell. Yeah, that, that makes Beautiful. Sense. But also, like, mm -hmm. yeah, wouldn't you want to build your club like that? I mean, you, you know, think? you, I mean, I remember when I saw you last year at the radio room. Yeah. And you got to the part, at the radio room? Yeah, in Greenville. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um and you got to the part where you and I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but you you do your whole explaining transgender to your redneck relatives. Bit, oh yeah. Which is yeah. a fucking phenomenal bit. Oh thank you, thank you. Um and and I'm not pandering to you. I just there are things that you do that I really think are quality, and I don't mind telling you that. Oh, so. I, just, I don't mind listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just don't. You know, it's like I don't want someone. I don't want you or someone listening to think that I'm. You know, kissing your ass by saying it. Like you have some things that I think are extremely high quality. And oh, and, thank you, man. Thank you. And uh, and really, you take some unbelievable risks on stage, and you knew you were taking well, thanks, a risk yeah. on that, and you and it, you started into it. And you know you could see people fidgeting, and, and you'd already been on stage for forty minutes, and you were like, "Hey, haven't I earned your trust by now? Like, just yeah. hang in there." And I remember you had to say it. You know what I mean? You, oh, yeah, yeah. you didn't have to say it to me. Right, right. I just happened to be there to hear it. But you did feel the need, and I think it wasn't inappropriate. Yeah. You had to say it to that room, and that's to me the you know the performance equivalent of what you're talking about with this guy and the way he builds his club, like. Yeah. You want to establish enough trust in your audience, in your case, for the night, or I mean, also as you're building your your base. But you know, in your case, for the night, and in his case, like that, anyone he brings to his club is going to be good, and they could come any night of the week and know that they're going to have a great show, not know what it's going to be like, but know it's going to be great because he's yeah, you know, he's. I mean, a, exactly. Yeah, Lewis is a fucking genius, and also comedy on state. They did this one time, where this is they, there was a table up front. And the guy told me beforehand, he was like, hey, look, this table, they showed up a little drunk. Um, we're on them. The moment they're a problem, we'll get rid of them. We didn't mean to sit them up front, but it just kind of worked out that way. Sorry if we have to throw them out. I'm, I'm like, oh, no, dude, I appreciate that. During the feature set, they became a problem, but the feature kind of handled it. But by the time I got on stage, they were just a full on, you know, so they were tossed right away. They were yeah. tossed like right away, quickly. And... The way they do it at both clubs, which I think is genius, this is also what the comedy seller does, is they don't go up to the table and say, you're out. They go up and say, excuse me, can you come with me, please? No, we need you. Um, they like they they make it seem like they're important. <laughs> they're, they're, they, I need you to come. You get they, they get you out of the room first. Right. And then they toss them. But I was basically like, everyone knew these people were getting tossed. So we right. just like, I made the audience say a goodbye to them and they applauded. <laughs> and then there was just this empty table up front. And I was like, well, does anyone want this table? This is prime real estate. And a, there was a bunch of applause. Right. And I was like, wait, who wants it? The, and like one couple was shouting like super loud. And I asked, I, I was like, can I, whoever's their waitress or waiter is, is it okay if they move? And the, the guy who books the place, or the, uh, runs the place, the manager got on the God mic and was like, yeah, it's fine. So they moved into this table. And they was like, all right, cool. And then I started into my set. And then 10 minutes into it, now they're the problem. Now really? they're, yeah, because they were also hammered. I couldn't tell right uh -huh. away. But I mean, Madison is an amazing city, but people fucking drink yeah. in Madison. And that's part of being now they're a problem. And I was like, do I have to throw you guys out as well? And they were like, no, 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 no. But then, of course, they were a problem. So then the, the code word at that club is I think this table needs a round of Diet Pepsis. <laughs> right. And then they that's when they them. know you want them out. Right. Because they'll, they'll, they tell you to wait. They'll wait until you pull the trigger. Oh, that's because some people yeah. want to do. Some comics like it. Some comics like fucking with hecklers. I think it's a waste of time. To be honest, you know. Some comics, it's like they're all about destroying hecklers. Me, I'm like, I spent a lot of time working on this material. I'm gonna fucking do it. Right. I want to do it. Um, so they get thrown out, and now again, there's an empty table, 
And I was like, does anybody else want to sit at the table? And everyone <laughs> sort of laughed, but there was a lot of people applauding. I was like, wait a second, hold on. Maybe the table's the problem. Maybe it's this fucking table. Can I? Can we get this table? I think we need to get this table some Diet Pepsis. <laughs> and the fucking house manager and one of the waiters came over, picked up the table, picked up the chairs, and and they removed it, threw it out. Oh, that's funny. And it was fucking. We're all dying. Even me, because I didn't expect right. anyone to do that. But think about what club would do that. Other like what other club would remove a physical table and chairs, an opportunity to get two more. There were people in the bar who they could have got to come sit in right. and buy the two drinks and watch the show. But instead, they were like, nope, let's facilitate the joke. Right? Right. And that's fucking amazing. And so, like, and that's, but yeah, my point of my big rant, rant about here is there are clubs, of course, that do that here in the U.S. But in the U.K., it just seems to be a little bit more, the, 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 it, they, they, they understand the idea of comedy a little bit more. Mm. That it's like, a, that it's a, that it's all a farce, that it's all a, it's we're all we're going into this like there's some there's a reason behind everything you do on stage. So if you say something that appears offensive or dramatic or whatever, they know all they trust that ultimately you're taking them somewhere. Whereas I feel like you can't get away with that all of the time here in the US. The audiences are not as quick to trust the performer. They're way more quick to get offended because they just want to be I'm offended. They want to make it about right, them, you know? Right. And I so I, I but I still, you know, I'm, I'm, I love performing here, of course. But I love performing in the UK, and I'm going back in a week. Um, yeah, I go. I'm, I'm going back in a week. I did, like I said, I did. I was there earlier this year. I went to Glasgow, did the comedy fest. My Scottish accent is pretty good. It's where it's difficult. I mean, give it a second. That is, I found it. It's in the back. It's from speaking from the back of your throat. I can just sort of let the words tumble out of your mouth at that on. They determine the speed and aggression at which they do. And you just speak. And it's not really the accent that's so difficult to understand. It's the speed at which they speak, which I can't do. <laughs> I can't speak that fast. But, however, I did uh, get on stage. I was fucking joking with one of the Scottish comics. I'm like, I bet I can, I'll bet I'll get up there and be Scottish. And he's like, oh, they're going to fucking eat you alive. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to do it. And I got up there. And I was like, hello. I'm like, and then I, there's a town called Aberdeen in Scotland, which apparently be, appears to be the city that every Scottish comedian shits on. Okay. So I just got on stage. I was like, I'm from man. Aberdeen. <laughs> yeah. And the audience laughed. And I was like, what? Do you think you're so fucking fancy here in Glasgow? What are you not? Aber in Aberdeen, we have uh, prostitution. And, they, and I was just fucking making shit up. And then finally, I was like, no, I'm not. Scottish actually <laughs> <laughs> at all and they thought that was funny but like it's hard to understand what a lot of Scottish people are saying yeah they speak it's and like I said it's not the accent it's the speed yeah 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 at which they talk but they understand us perfectly yeah that's another reason why I love going to the UK you don't have to change your fucking material at all unless you're doing like some hyper specific bits about local businesses in fucking you know Asheville. cleveland ohio or Asheville, <laughs> unless you're that everything else they are well abreast of what's going on in our world yeah well everyone you know? i mean first of all most people in places like england scotland anywhere in europe yeah they're way more cognizant of what's happening outside of their country than Absolutely. we are of what's happening outside our country oh, yeah. and then the second piece is the one country that most of the world is most cognizant of is ours is the us yeah so you know we export so much entertainment i mean they're used to hearing people tell american style jokes and american accents oh, yeah. i mean you know oh, yeah. they're exactly and like so yeah it's like i'm going but i'm just trying to i went i did that festival in march and then i went over there all of may and now i have um, now I have uh, agents over there, and like like I said, I'm I'm going over there in a week, and then I'm going. I think I got to go in all of July, and then yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm excited to do Edinburgh. I really am, and I understand what it is. It's a it's it's work. Like people, I think a lot of Americans comics go over there and just get completely fucking overwhelmed by it all, and end up like hating their set after two weeks and then right. they're there for two more weeks right and i'm like no you gotta go you gotta perform every night like it's being filmed and you gotta like be on top of that shit you don't it's not it's not like a normal comedy fest which you go and it's like half like oh i'm gonna go up there and have a good set and the other half 
like, oh, but I'm also going to get fucking crap, shit faced and party and try and fuck everything. You're in Edinburgh for a month. You've got to like, you got to pace yourself. You got to pace yourself, yeah. but you also got to realize there's so many shows that if yours doesn't get a good review and stand out in some way, you've just lost money and spent a fucking month in up in Scotland. Right to no avail. It's like if you're gonna go, you gotta go. You gotta, you gotta go big, and that's what I'm intending to do, is go there and just have the best shows I possibly fucking can. Twenty nine in a row, or however many it is. And will you do the same set every night? Yeah, you have to. That's the, you, that's, you have to that's like. The rule. I mean, you don't have to. You do whatever you want, but like, you you have to in the sense that Edinburgh is all based around the reviewers, and the reviewers you don't know when they're coming. Right. You don't know when they're coming. They can come to any show, and if you get a bad review, it can fuck your whole month. Mm -hmm. But if you get a good review, and a good review from the right reviewer, you could be the bell of the ball. Right. So you've got to like really, you know, you, you could be, you get you get that one good review, and that le and then like you know like any like any that world I'm sure, like there are the you know if certain reviewers see the one good review from that reviewer they're going to want to go and jump in on they're going to want to jump on the gravy train as well right so then if you get a couple if you get like a few really awesome um a few really fucking awesome reviews you could i mean you could leave edinburgh a king or queen <laughs> whichever you choose a, a knight how about that a knight cuz a knight i think or a knights, dame. Or a dame. Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, true. Yeah, dames are. But, uh, royalty. Yeah, leave royalty. <laughs> royalty. <laughs> you can leave royalty. But, but yeah, I mean, I love, I don't know, but it's, it's, comedy is, it's such a universal thing that, like, you gotta, I don't know, at a certain point, I just felt like, you gotta start treating it that way. You gotta start, like, I wanna be able to take it to other countries, and I also wanna be able to take it to, you know, I don't, I love, like I said, I love performing in the States. I love performing in places like Asheville and, you know, Asheville and Austin and Chicago and, you know, New Orleans. Wonderful. My home, you know. But at the same time, like, it's there's it, there's there's a fucking world out there. And they like laughing at things, too. Yeah. You know, and that's that's interesting to me. The idea of being like a global comedian. What about doing uh -huh. like the military circuit? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I've I, I've never been interested in that. Like, not because I don't, not because I don't fucking support troops or whatever. It's because, like, you know, they're they're nineteen year old, you know, meatheads. Right. That's what you want? I mean, I'm not saying that's an in. That's where the nighthead nineteen year old meatheads belong. Right. In the military, and like, I don't know. I would do it, but it also seems like it. It seems like they just would fucking stare at me. What's this? Who's this fucking fat piece of shit? You know, oh, I think I think they'd like you. Well, so we'd see. I, yeah. I I would do it, but it's also like there yeah. are comedians who like that's what they do. They do the USO tours. And I really then you're like stepping on their turf. You know. Well, yeah, I guess I was thinking more from like I, I think it'd be fascinating to then watch you perform sometime in the year following because I would think it'd be interesting what you would take from that. Yeah, you clearly take. I mean, you take, I don't know how much of your act is fiction, fact, where the where the line is, if there is one, um, but you appear to be working from real life experiences and real pieces of yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I tell, I tell a lot of stories on stage, and people ask me all the time, it's like, how do you have so many stories? And, dude, we all have so many goddamn stories, just uh, most people don't see that they're stories. Right. Most people just... They, your entire fucking life is a story, you know. You you could you you could find moments everywhere. I don't believe in wasted time. I don't believe in that as a concept. Like, sure, maybe you just sat on a couch and didn't do anything for two hours, but something's there. Right. You experienced something. You learned something. You thought something. Like, there's there's a story everywhere. You just got to be willing to dig it up. And like every single the way I talk about like everything I say on stage, it's like a tree. The truth is the ground. Okay, the right. tree has to be rooted in the ground. That's every story I tell. Right. Like it's all one hundred percent rooted in truth. Every event that I talk about on stage happened. The way the tree grows, however, the way the branches go, that's unpredictable. Right. But they have to be rooted in. They have to be rooted in truth, and that's yeah. That's that's 
that's why you can also uh, that's why i also feel like i could take risks because it's like yeah fact check me i don't give a shit yeah or believe me or don't believe me but you know like that's i'm taking you on this journey because it comes from somewhere you know yeah i, I don't hang a, I, I can hang a swing on this tree because it's healthy I don't think yeah. I don't think a comedian needs to be fact checked. I mean, your job isn't to you're not running for office. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I heard recently the definition for comedy that I really liked, which is that comedy equals truth plus exaggeration. Sure, sure. And I thought just as like a, sure. you know, yeah. where do you start from kind of place? That's great, and that's uh, yeah. you described it in a different way with the tree in the ground and. and yeah. But the tree is the exaggeration. The true, you know, how yeah. that grows and what you decide to make it look like and mm, what kind of tree grow it is. It's on its own, yeah. Yeah. Um, and but it, it just can't has to grow be... without the soil. Right. You know, that's learned. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I have I have bits that I do that are every and everything comes from some amount of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can feel when I leave the truth, I feel like I lose the audience. Like they can tell that I just that I just left the truth you know like that yeah and it's one thing there's a way to do it where i mean sometimes i'll do it and it's fine like they, they don't mind that i did it right but other times it's it's just no it's not believable anymore well yeah they have to they, they have to have something to hang on to something yeah. like but that's also like i mean that's also true with just jokes you know like there, there's got to be something there for the audience to like connect with i think yeah and like oh for sure the uh and I know, like the statement, "funny because it's true," in its sense, in its own, in itself, has become a punchline, right? You know? But it's, but it's fucking legit, yeah. You know? And the, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, I also feel like on stage, like you, you have to, like, I don't, I, I, I guess I get it. Like the sole reason you don't take risks, someone doesn't take risks on stage, like. Is because for monetary purposes. That's really like there. Look, I there are some brilliant comedians out there who also work a hundred percent clean. Like that's their thing, and you know, bless them. I got no beef, and I admire some of them because they're they're able to just you know write such clever you know bits without having to be you know having to get foul, right? Right. But when you look at the motivation behind that, what is it? For bookability, right? To make more money, to get out there, and it's like, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, of course, everybody wants to make money, but like, I don't know. That that's that's where Walmart's come from, and like, yeah, that's you know, where Charlotte comes from. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, like Walmart and Charlotte are both mega successful places, but they won't be. You know, it's just like, it's there's nothing to them. There's no one's special. proud. No one's proud of what they right. bought at Walmart. <laughs> exactly. People, in fact, are ashamed that they have to go there sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I look at like, I mean, if, you know, if you, I, I, and it's hard to say because like, it, it, it's, I'd be hypocritical if I, be a hypocrite if I said, you know, I didn't, of course I want to fuck, of course making money doing comedy is amazing. And, you know, of course I want to keep doing that, but on my own terms. And I'd rather make less money being truly me than more money becoming this product becoming like a right. you know like i'd rather perform in front of you know 250 fans than 1000 audience members yeah you understand like i'd rather i'd rather make and that's the other thing about it it's like i'd rather make a comfortable living but be happy knowing that i'm creating something great and creating something truly hilarious and 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 great than be rich but know that i'm just sort of yuck mucking out just you know what interchangeable you know vanilla right you know what i mean like that's that's I, but i don't think i think a lot of people don't want that i think a lot of people want to be rich and they want to be a jeff foxworthy you know they want to be a bill engvall god you know whatever god bless them but like if, you're, if we're looking at that why wouldn't you just want to be ron white actually Who's right. probably just as rich, but but like, <laughs> but he's at least like unique. But like, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, comedy gets compared to music a lot, and it's like, well, I mean, okay, look who's out there. Do you want to be fucking Nickelback? They, I mean, shit on Nickelback all day. They're fucking millionaires, right? Or do you want to be the Mountain Goats? You know, like yeah, maybe a lot of people don't know who that those guys are, but they perform nonstop and they make a. I'm guarantee they all live a very healthy financial lives. 
and they have fans. You know, it's like, you want to be fucking Nick Kroger or John Dar Don Darniel? What's his last? You know, you know who they are. No, the Mountain Goats. No, highly recommend them, dude. I okay. bet you love them. All right, and they're, I think I think they're from North Carolina, but like, it's like they're just like an I, awesome. I'm, I'm, I know who Nickelback is, which speaks to your point exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But you know, I guarantee if you went to a Nickelback concert, there's a lot of lights and sound, and it's huge, and it's in a stadium, and there's these songs you remember from the radio that you're not really like, oh, this is awesome, but you're like, oh yeah, I know this song. But you go see the Mountain Goats, you probably have never heard of it, and you're in a smaller venue with you know, a couple hundred other people, and you're like, what's this gonna be like? And then by the end of it, you're like, that was fucking awesome. Right. I'm changed. I'm now a fan of this music. You know, it's just, so I think the, I, I, I try and approach comedy with that same mindset of like, like whenever I write a bit, I'm like, what is this though? What do I want this to be? Am I right? Cause, it, cause it, you catch yourself doing that, especially after you've been exposed to being on TV. You catch yourself. I catch myself doing it all the time where I'm writing a bit and I'm trying to write it for TV. Uh, and it's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Right. Don't do that. Because I've done that and it didn't work. You know, I've only done three late night spots. I don't like late night. It's a, it's a, it's a stress. It's stressful. It's a stressful, like, situation. And the way I perform and the way I write, I'm just not made for late night. I love doing spots on TV. That's why I love doing Ari's show. You know, doing the uh, this is not happening on Comedy Central, uh -huh. things like that. Doing like, you know, and I'm shooting an hour this year, so it's like I love doing that. But like late night spots are just, you got four and a half to six minutes, you know, and it's in and it's just like I'm, I'm too much of a, I'm too tightly wound for those things. But I've done three, and like, I think my first one was really good, and I think my second one was good, but I, my third one was bad. My second Conan set, watch it, I bombed. Really. But I took a I took a risk and it didn't it didn't pan out. But I also it was a risk I shouldn't have taken on late night. It was a bad choice, you know. It was one bit, mm. you know. And it was just and I've seen it work. I've seen other comedians do like one bits, and it crushed it. But the one I chose to do just didn't work. And and is that a like, bit that you have been working on in clubs and yeah yeah? So I've been working it out. But here's the problem with the bit is it, it is that bit specifically which I love. It's a true story. About, I mean, I'm not going to do the bit, but it's basically like my brother's 14 years younger than me. And uh, when he was four, the movie Men in Black had just come out. Mm -hmm. And he loved that movie. And he even, he he made a, a neuralizer. Did you ever see Men yeah. in Black? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made one. Right. Like he it was like a, you know, he just made a fucking neuralizer out of like a paper towel tube, you know, and drew a bunch of things. <laughs> and I was 18. A right. shitty fucking senior in high school. Fuck everything. And he um, would, like, neuralize me. That was his, like, game. He right. was, like, neuralize. Like, boo! He'd make a little sound, and I'd be like, oh, you know. <laughs> I'd pretend like I didn't know what was going on. And it was this thing. And then, like, one day, he just caught me in, like, a bad fucking fuck the world teenage mood. And he kept trying to neuralize me. And I was just trying to, like, I was like, stop it, stop it. And I just got annoyed and, like, yelled. and was like, fucking quit it! Fucking stop right fucking now! And that was like the first time I ever yelled at him. And he's four years old. Right. And it like freaks him out. And he just like stares at me for a second. And he's like starts crying. He just doesn't know how to react. And then he fucking turns the neuralizer on himself. <laughs> himself? I, yeah. knew it. I was yeah. hoping that's what you were yeah. going to say. Yeah. And uh, then the bit. Uh, this part's a little more. Uh, I, I, but, but like basically like 10 years later. He was. uh teenager and i was i'd been living in new york for like a year it was my first christmas home and uh he fucking we're, we're like I, I get him a drink at this my family christmas party we're like having right. a drink and we're just talking and it i'd been i was drunk and i guess i'd just been sitting on top of all this emotion for a decade and i just unleashed like just like right there start crying and like i'm so sorry man i can't I fucking think about that shit all the time. Like, you know, I was your brother. I'm your brother, and you you looked up to me, and I fucking screamed at you, and like, I never said I was sorry, and all this. And he was just like calming me down, and then says the magic words. He was like, "But I don't remember that at all." Yeah. And then I was like, "Well, because like, that fucking neuralizer worked, man. <laughs> You're a genius." But like, that's not a thing you say on late night. I think right. I think it was just too much for a late night set, and it fucking it fucking tanked. Like. It got very little reaction, and then Conan had to come out and be like, all right, good job. And I could tell he was like, what the fuck is that? 
what was that shit? And I feel bad because the booker, the guy who books Conan, is legitimately one of the best human beings in the industry, mm-hmm. in the entertainment industry. He's a he's he's I mean in in this all around like he's a great fucking man. His name's JP Buck. I'm not gonna give you his email address, <laughs> no. but he's a great man, just a chill fucking awesome dude. But he also is excellent at what he does. He's got a great eye for comedy. He loves producing good stuff. He's just a wonderful guy, and he put he let me take that risk, and it fucking, you know, what I'm saying like it fell short, and I felt horrible for that. Like it was like, oh man, like you trusted me, and then the, the thing fell apart. And like I know, and that was three years ago. And I know, like I could have probably by now asked to do another set, but it's like I just you got to accept who you are as a comedian. That's an important part of growing as a comic. And I am not a late night comedian. It's just the way I do perform is not meant for that late night. Right. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I am a. You can watch me on TV, comedian, but I think it has to be in the special form. You know. Right. But um. But some people are fucking amazing late night. Rory Scovel is the best late night comedian. He's the best. But and that's the thing. Rory doesn't do jokes. Rory's not like a total setup punch guy. He right. does, but he's also got a persona and he's also got he's uh, every set he does has like an overall bit to it. Him and John Dore together are fucking beautiful on late night. You know, Bargatze's a great Norman, Mark Norman's a great late night guy. Uh who just did great late night sets. Carmen Lynch, she's awesome. I mean, they're all uh, fucking, I mean, there's so many fucking great late night spots, but it's just, it's a, anyway, I feel like I'm just rambling about No, this it's now. perfect. This is, fa- to me, this yeah. is fascinating. Like, I'm a young, trying to figure it out comic, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, I'm not a, I'm 47, but I'm, but comedically I'm young, you know? my. I mean, aunt- yeah, dude, well, comedic, that's, that's also the beautiful, the beautiful thing about comedy is age makes you better. Yeah. The be- the older age is important. To being good, I feel that way. You know, I, I don't like to talk about myself that way, but I, you know, I'm I'm in the local comedy scene here. Yeah, you know, and um, I I feel like I have more to draw from, you know, sure. than some of the people, and and sometimes I can see it show. Other people, I'm like blown away by how good they are and how young they are. Sure, sure. You know, it's just it's, some people are prodigies, man. Yeah. Some people figure it out quick. Yeah. Some people get to it. Anyway. Um, that's the thing. There's such a, there's so many, I wish fucking North Carolina would get taken over by like a socialist democratic governor and like this. Cause I, I really do love this state. Like you got Asheville, you got Greensboro, you got Raleigh, Durham, and you got uh, Wilmington. Wilmington. Those are the four. And you have Charlotte. Charlotte, outside of the Commie Zone, has some good spots. But just those five cities. And then you've also got Winston-Salem, which I've never been to, but I'm performing this weekend, tomorrow. Mm. You've got Winston. So those are six cities that I know of, five of which I've performed comedy in, four of which I've loved. Right. I'm sure there's still great shows in Charlotte. I just haven't done them. And, and Winston-Salem's supposed to be really good. And that's all, in one state. It's a lot of fucking awesome places. That's great. Right. That's fucking great. Yeah. You know, it's like, and then South Carolina's got some great, I mean, I've only done Charleston and Greenville. Yeah, Columbia probably has. Yeah. But, oh no, that's not true. I've also done, oh damn it, what's it called? Shit. Oh, it's such a shit. Myrtle Beach? Oh, yes. I had done Myrtle Beach. It was Myrtle Beach Comedy Club. Um, that's this that, that, that city shouldn't have a comedy club in it. Sorry, sorry, Myrtle Beach, but it's like fucking Atlantic City, basically. Um, no, oh, throw out a South Carolina town or two. I mean, I'm not. I know. I'm oh, not you're not from, from there. You know, there's this tiny. I can't remember what's called. It's this tiny little fucking hamlet. Clemson? You don't mean Clemson? Not Clemson. Okay. Tiny little hamlet in South Carolina, like a small. Jared Harris hooked it up. It was when. Nate Pergazzi, Jared, uh, Rory, and I were on that tour. Uh, we did this little town, and it was this fucking beautiful little, like, picturesque southern Main Street, old buildings. We stayed in this old-ass hotel. We got in kind of late. Um, the bar was closing in the hotel, but they're like, oh, we'll stay open for an extra hour for you guys. We got drinks. We had a fucking great time. 
And then the next night, the show was completely sold out. And we were like, yes. But it was one of the worst shows because the audience was like riled up, rowdy, overexcited, drunk. So they're just pl- they're just trying to be a part of everyone's set. And it was kind of annoying. But then afterwards, after we like drink with them for a while, this guy's like, man, you guys were so awesome. Out in the bar, down the block. It was we're closed tonight. I'll go open up for you guys. Like, what? Okay. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, bring a couple of friends. So maybe about 10 of us go to this bar. <laughs> and he fucking opens a bar for us. That's cool. And we're like, cool. And he gets us all a drink. And then a few minutes later, like, you all want to do shots? And we're like, of course we all want to do shots. <laughs> and then he lines us all up a shot. We all do a big shot. And then as soon as everyone takes a shot, he's like, get the fuck out. Everyone get the fuck out. And we're like, what? And he's like, okay, go ahead. You, I see what y'all are doing now. Fucking okay, I get it. I get it now. Get the fuck out. We're all just like, all right, man. And then was we, he serious? Yeah, he was all dead. That's the thing. At first, we were like, ha ha ha, funny. It sounds like one of your bits. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> sounds like yeah, exactly. And then, I <laughs> said, but no, he was so wasted. I think he forgot that he invited invited you. us. Right, yeah. And then took that shot and was like, these fuckers using me because I know I own a bar. That's what we all think. <laughs> and he threw us out. And we were like, cool, man. Later. Thanks for the one beer and one shot and complete awkward, frightening moment where that guy would add a gun. He probably would open fire on us. He was mad, too. That was the other thing. He was, like, mad. He was, like, yeah, that was, he was that kind of mad. He was, like, I, where he was, like, breathing all weird. Like, right. get the fuck out of here. And we're like, all right, man. We'll go. There's women. We have women with us. Chill out. Don't yeah. be such a dick. Not that women can't handle it, but you know what I mean? It's in the like, south. Well, it's not chivalrous. It's it's, yeah. it's it's not in keeping with uh But but aside from that place, but yeah, Charleston's beautiful. Theater ninety nine is a great place to perform. But like I really do love I really do love North Carolina a lot. And I wish the government would allow gay people to just be happy and let them and let them have all gender bathrooms. Not that just gay people want those, but for transgender people. Yeah, yeah. Which I see a lot of places in Asheville. Have all, totally, but have all yeah. like purposely done. Multi- oh yeah, it's part of Asheville genius. rebelling yeah. against that yeah. ridiculousness. You know, I mean, in fact, when I go yeah. to a place and I don't see that, yeah. that now sticks out to me. You know, well, like there's a there's a there's a bar in Brooklyn, New York called Union Hall, which is one of my favorite bars in in New York. Uh, it's a perfect. It's it's an almost perfect bar. He, upstairs, it's you know I've got a bar. It's got a bocce ball court inside, right? Which is chill. But and downstairs, there's like a tiny showroom, like a eighty seater. But they do a ton of comedy down there, and it's fucking amazing. But what's really interesting is the bathroom. It's only one bathroom. It's ten stalls, but fully enclosed stalls. Mm. So you no, know, you can't see under, and you go in out. Right. And sinks, and that's it. It's not no male, no female. It's just ten stalls. You and it's such a fucking a. No one's ever been harassed because right. multiple genders in one bathroom. No right. one's ever been confused by it or felt threatened. Two, it's kind of funny to be washing your hands next to after using a bathroom next to someone of the opposite sex. Also washing their hands, who clearly just took a dump. <laughs> but third, it's also kind of just like I I know how weird this sounds, but like it's just a reminder of the of of yeah, we're all people. Right. It's like you just there's like a human element to it of like, hey, how's it going, beautiful woman? Right. Or hey, how's it going from a woman's perspective, beautiful man? Yeah. You know, and it's just like yeah, or just normal man. It's just like it's not <laughs> just. There's nothing weird. And like, yeah, there's women in there putting on makeup and chatting it up a few things. It's like it's not a it's not a strange thing to have multi gendered bathrooms. Right. Or or pan gender or whatever they would call it. It's just like it's fucking it's the bathroom for Christ's sake. Well, it's part mm-hmm. of our American thing, you know. It's part of the it's it's not out of sync with the whitewashing thing you were talking no, about. No, I know, yeah. It's part it's, of the everyone yeah. It's con- it's it's the conservative mindset of like fear that that is different, yeah. And it's like, but it doesn't. It clearly. I mean, but dude, I mean, if we're talking about comedy though. That also exists in the comedy world, and it pisses me off all the time. I never agree with it. We're like, there are people in the comedy world who believe stand up comedy is standing at a microphone and telling jokes, and there's no exception to that rule. Right. And I'm like, no, stand up comedy. My definition of it is getting on a stage and being funny. Whatever right? that looks like. Right. One, you know, one person. 
If it has, if it's if it's a group, once you start getting into groups, I think it changes the dynamic. Right. Now we're talking sketch, you know. But if it's one person getting on stage being funny, one person getting on stage being funny doesn't matter if they have a microphone or not. I've seen that complaint where like, you know, Eddie Izzard, oh, but he doesn't use a mic. Who gives a fuck? It's a microphone. Is that how you define stand up? Right. By holding a microphone? Because that's ridiculous. I don't like the whole brick wall, microphone, spotlight, stool need. I like the setup. Right. I love it's my home, basically. If I'm more comfortable in that situation than I am pretty much every other one. I think it's beautiful, but I don't think it's the only f possible setup for stand up. Yeah, no, know? it's just become iconic. But become iconic. But I feel like. Yeah, there are some great classic stand-up comics out there. Some great, like, stylistically. I appreciate that style. But there has to be, just like they have to be the purists, they've got to be the innovators as well. Right. So, I, like, getting on stage alone and being funny. That is stand-up. It doesn't have to be jokes. It could be silent. It could be silent. If someone gets on stage and somehow does an entire silent act and you laugh at it, that, that they have succeeded at performing stand-up comedy. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it does. I don't. I, I just don't like the that. But there are. Believe you me, man. In the years I've been doing it, God, the shit I have heard talked about other comedians based solely on the fact that they are different, and the shit talking is done by boring, usually white straight comedians. You know, just like what is that shit? That's not comedy. And then you want to be like, so what is comedy? What you do? Getting on stage with one hand in your pocket, not removing the mic from the stand, telling jokes about very well-worn topics. Yeah, okay. That's right. what it's got to be? No. I'm going to side with the person. I'm going to side with the guy who gets on stage and in character. And then I, I'm just, there's so many, it, it could be anything, man. I've seen some, I don't know. Anyway, that's just, I, I, I didn't see this, but this, I was in Australia and this guy was telling me, he, he told me and this other comedian this as if we were going to agree with him and be like, oh, yeah, that was dumb. But basically, story goes real quick. There's an open mic that they all do in Melbourne. And this one comedian, newer guy, he kept showing up week after week. He'd get on the list and he would do the exact same five minute set. And, and according to the guy telling the story, it was a very just mundane, boring set that would get chuckles at best. Mm. So after like the fifth or sixth time he shows up, they pull him aside after his set and they're like, look, mate, you can st you can come back next week, but you got to do something different. You right. got to do something different. So he shows up next week, he gets on the list, they call his name, and he goes on stage dressed in full zombie regalia <laughs> and has a zombie does that same, same exact, exact set. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this guy, tell he's telling us this as if we're, but he's saying it from a perspective of like, what kind of bullshit is that? And me and this other comedian he was talking to, her name was Roisin Conaty. She's a British comedian. She's brilliant. We both like lose our fuck, like, like have to hold on to one another to prevent from collapsing. We're laughing so hard. He's like, you think that's funny? I'm like, do you not think that's funny? Like, that's genius. Like, I think you guys got long conned. Like, I don't think that was happenstance. I, I kind of think you were in the presence of pure comedic brilliance. Like, I think the guy knew what he was doing. I think he was like, I'm just going to go to an open mic and just keep doing it until someone tells me to do it differently. Oh, and I, I yeah. and I bet he had a response. It was an installation. Yeah, and I bet he had an idea for anything. Like if they'd have told him he had to, you have to write a new set. Maybe he would have come in dressed like a fucking writer, and right there with a pen and paper, written the exact same set. Or you know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't know because this guy, uh, they'd have been like, look, man, you can't come back for a month, and when you do, you better be a little more high energy. Maybe to come on stage all coked up. And like and covered in like set. lightning bolts and jogging really fast, but done the exact same set. I like I think the guy was an actual fucking genius, because that's that is mind bendingly funny. Well, it's it is. You know? it's, well, I mean, it's, it's two layers. I mean, yeah, it's layered. Yeah. I mean, so it's a really funny thing to do to the guys who said you can't keep doing this right, set. Right. But it also could be that this guy is so unimaginative yeah. that he's like 
well, maybe he doesn't understand what they mean by you can't oh, come back that, and I, do the same thing. That, so he, you have to be, he has to be some level of autistic then because, but that, <laughs> no, I don't, I see, I don't think it's unimaginative. I think anybody who, when told they have to do something different, decides to dress like a zombie has more imagination than you give him credit for. Maybe unimaginative is the wrong word. Yeah. yeah. What, I, what I mean is like, maybe he didn't understand the assignment. Like he didn't understand oh, that, that, you know, we need, you need to branch out from this five minutes. You know, we want to hear you do some other. And so his idea of you got to do something different is, oh, okay, I'll just dr dress I mean, different. if that, okay, if that's the case, then th he's the stupidest. He's like a savant. <laughs> and, and also like, follow that guy around in life because he might be just the dumbest funniest guy ever yeah i i just don't see it that way i think there it maybe and maybe he had the idea after they told him maybe he like because this will happen a lot in comedy where you do something on stage and it fucking tanks and then you spend the next two days beating yourself up and then but from that comes a great idea right um Maybe that happened to him, but I don't know. It just seems too, like, that just seems too smart comedically. Because, obvious, I just don't think there's any way someone would say, you got to do something different, and they wouldn't understand that it wasn't about the set. I think he had to know that's what they were talking about, and he had to know, like, oh, this is fucking funny, though, because you're going yeah, to the but next. Is it the same audience every week? Uh, that was what we asked him, and he said, yeah. He said it, he said it was, well, he said it was, Mostly all yeah, comics. Yeah. Oh, so I it was see. like the same like. Well, in that case, you know? I mean, I so yeah. I think like I still I I I still see it as two things happening simultaneously. Like, oh. I think it's very funny. I I want to also want to say I like the way you see it better than the way it, that I feel like I'm inclined to see it. Like I like your mind. Like the fact okay. that you know. Well, thank you. I mean, like the the that you're seeing it that way. It didn't occur to me right away that like it's a long con. Like even oh, after you said dude. it, I had to think about it. And then, now I get it. Like I think him. That also comes from the fact that I'm suspicious of everyone. So I don't. It's like I. I think like most. I'm like most things that people do aren't not planned in some way. Oh, see, and that yeah. you know what it comes from in me, and I hate to say this out loud, so yeah. I'll say it out loud on the internet. Yeah, buddy. You know, is like, I. I'm. I'm too often unimpressed with people like you did I, live you, in ecuador you know i mean <laughs> i'm fluent you've been around you know, you no i mean it's like i just i i mean when i'm blown away by somebody like then i'm really fucking blown away that's good that's good. you know like your person in with a comedy club that has that is it the acne club which is the club that where the guy has he's like his acne. own curator yeah acne yeah so you know I feel, I mean, I think we all do to a degree, and we're not all right, including me, possibly, but I, I really trust my sensibilities. And so, you know, some people I just don't think they're funny, and and yeah. and I admire them for working that hard. There's this one comic here in town, and it's, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, I don't know why, I'm just not, I go on stage after him a lot, and I make fun of him every time, and it's not nice. And the reason I do it is because the first time I met him, he asked me if he could use my – like, I didn't know him. He walked up to me in the bar while I'm working on my set. Yeah. And um, he said, hey, man, can I use your phone to check my Facebook? What? And I was like – and I looked at him like, I, I don't know you. He's like, my, he's like, hey, my guitar is right here, you know? Like, that would help me trust him. Okay. You know? Interesting. And I was just like, um, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I didn't really answer him, but the answer was no. Like, I'm not going to – I mean, it's not an em it was an emergency, sure. Yeah, but you know, it, he just wanted to check his Facebook. From I mean, what dude, I could tell. Yeah. So and then he and so I just have a hard. I don't know why. I just it's just this thing. And I, he's the nicest guy, you know. I just have, but I have a hard time taking him seriously. And I and I always kind of, I always, my first thing on stage is always to say something about him. And I don't usually do that. I don't know what my problem is with him. I gotta. I think I gotta sit down is and make he friends funny? with him. Um, not yet. You know, he's he. He's young and he's um, he's a, in my mind. There's like a he's a little unaware of of the space he takes up in the room, and mm. the, you know, he okay. kind of floats in and out in a way that's like you know he's whether he's blocking someone's view or coming in and out in the middle of a set. Like it's there's a lack of consciousness about his 
the waves he's making, you know, the okay. ripples in the yeah. air, you know, yeah, yeah. like yeah. the the uh, disturbance in, that he creates in the Akash, right? <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like, and so there's something about that 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 rubs me. And this is I'm acknowledging me being a, a not meaning to, but being kind of a dick, you know. It's like I just there's something about it that that I have a hard time with, and and then he's you know. I think he could be fun. I think he's got a lot of he's got a lot of natural charisma. And, and I almost said when I went up the other night, and then I forgot. But I always I almost said something to the degree like I never know if like I want to sage the stage after this guy, or if I feel like I'm one day I'm going to be like I used to go up after that guy. Like he's going to be this amazing, uh, accomplished being because yeah. he's got something. There's something to him that's kind of special, but I can't tell if it'll launch. Right. Good. So at least you're getting knowledge, you know, I mean, I'm just real quick. I will never again let I, I do not let strangers use my phone. And it's a thing that for some reason gets approached more than often. But like one time I called uh, an ambulance for someone. Right. But after they three or four times were like, no, I just need to use your, it's an emergency. I was like, what is the emergency? Right. And then finally they were like, my friend over here is vo like they're vomiting and he won't stop fucking throwing up. We don't know. We think he, I was like, well, just I'll call. I'm not going to, why don't you trust me to call? Right. Why don't either one of you have phones? But um, I let someone use my phone once. Some some lady, she called her her man to tell her to, like she needed to be picked up. And then the dude called me like 12 times after that. Oh, thinking you were. So, yeah, curious, like to pick my brain about why, what I was doing with this girl. Again, like, oh. the first time he called, I didn't, I, I didn't recognize the number. But he had my number now. See? Right, right, right. So right. I didn't recognize the number, so I just let it go to voicemail, and he didn't leave one. And then he called two more times, no voicemail. So I just was like, that must be some number, one of those, like, they got my number on an right, online right. survey. And then the fourth time, he finally left a message. And I was like, oh, that number again. And this is all over the span of, like, four or five days, by the way. It wasn't right. even a week. So I listened to the message, and it's just him being like, look, man, I just, I need, an, I need, I need the truth. I need to know what the truth is, man. Like, why were you? And I just need to know, man. It's I, 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 I got nothing against you. I just need to know, man. I'm sure you didn't know she had, you know. And I was like, oh god. <laughs> so I called the dude back. And I was like, look, man. I real talk. I was outside of a bar smoking a cigarette. She walked by, said she needed to use the phone. That's it. And he then he immediately was like, that's bullshit, man. Don't <laughs> come on, man. Don't fucking play me for a fool. And now it was like, all right, now I'm worried. Right. Now I got this guy. And I just reassured him over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. And then was finally like, I got to go, man. Sorry, bye. And then he called back later that night. And I let it go to voicemail again. And that voicemail, I, that one I wish I would have saved because it was like terrifying right. but hilarious. Because <laughs> he was drunk. Then he was drunk. And right. he was just like, I swear to God, I fucking, I know your name. I'm going to find you. I'm going to fucking confront you, man. To your face, tell me that. And, and it was just this, I'm going to find you. Yeah. Because I want to look in your eyes and get the truth kind of shit. And it was like, fuck, dude. Yeah. And then I talked to my cousin, who's a Homeland Security agent, <laughs> and uh, asked him what to do about it. He's like, oh, man, call him back. He's like, seriously, call him back. Like, if he, if, like, he, he, if he threatens you, you've already got a message that he's already threatening you, like, yeah, like, he can't do shit, but you should call him back just to see if he's serious. I was like, all right, I'll call him back. And I did call him back, and I was like, but it was like the next day. Right. And it was like, look, uh, once again, man, and I told him, I was like, you're threatening me. I don't fucking, I don't even know your girlfriend's name, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, all right, man, it's totally cool. It's totally cool. You know, I just wanted, I just wanted to know that you were being honest. I was like, all right, bye. I don't <laughs> expect to hear from you again. But then he called me like three more times, but this time, the first time was like, I'm really sorry. I just want you to know I overreacted. I get a little protective of her. I'm really sorry. Second time was like, hey, man, I'd appreciate if you answer the phone. I just want to make sure we're cool, squash any beef. But then the third time was like, motherfucker, I'm trying to apologize to you. You need to fucking answer the phone. And I just never contacted. I just yeah, stopped. And he, and he finally stopped. Yeah. But after that, it was like, nope. Yeah. Nada. Yeah. I let a fucking... Young and it was like it wasn't like she was a shady looking girl. I you know what I'm saying? She she was like a young, like fucking twenty-two year old. And so of course I was like, Yeah, sure, use my phone. Right. 
and still this dude who I don't know. He sounded way older. That was a thing. Like I do think he was probably like a forty year old boyfriend to some like right. pretty hot young girl. That's why he was so paranoid about everything. But like that shit is it's like it's it's a, it, it's also a strange thing. Even if I was like phoneless on the streets, I would not ask an individual to use their phone. I would go into a bar or a coffee shop. Mm. Or a hotel or something, be like, "Hi, can I use a landline? Right, a phone? You know, like I'm not, I don't understand the concept of like, oh, can I use your phone, stranger? I think somebody in that situation, yeah, doesn't have the context that you already have to oh, think true. that way. Yeah, probably. Otherwise, they'd have a phone. I would like, yeah, exactly. That's just, especially when someone's like, can I check my Facebook? Like, all right, yeah. That, why, like, why do you need to check your Facebook so bad? I, I just didn't want to get in. And I was also like, you know, I was working on my computer, so I was clearly occupado, doing something, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and just like in my zone and with a jacket. I was I was very if you read my energy, there was like a black circle around me, you know, <laughs> and you California fuck. You read <laughs> that's, that's, my. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! I'm just I'm trying to give it a, a no. An that's, image. That's, that's that's actually like I I said that to you and then was like immediately like yeah, but I read I do that I do generally. You're like, really good at reading energy. Yeah, just, like and when yeah. I thought it was interesting when you were sort of you were, were analyzing my voice. You know, it's like this guy's really observes his environment and people around him in a way that I don't think I do. Yeah, you but know? you know what? You know what though? That can swing to the unhealthy side too, because I get real like I will I will look at people around me and just like. I, you don't know how many times I've like stared down, got like guys, at, like I'm at a bar and there's a dude at a bar at the bar by himself, with like a with like a face that's very like to me off putting. Mm. Not like what his face looks like, just like what his mood. Oh. I'm like, that dude might be like, might have just done something awful, or might be on his way to do something awful. And like, what if I'm the person who sees it? And what if I fucking Say something. What if I go fucking say like, "Hey, like that guy looks like he might go try and fucking choke a girl out or something." Right. And like, I, but then like, you can't just assume that. <laughs> and then you're like, then what do you do? Like, should I follow this guy? <laughs> and then like, then I'm like, what are you doing? Fucking following a guy? So you don't do anything. So this, you tie yourself in this knot. Oh, oh yeah, my God. that's great. And you don't. But then you don't do anything, and then you just feel weird about like I. I mean, I know th this is a fucking thing. Like I, it's just like two days. No, it's like wait. When was the last time I was? It was December. It's like almost a month ago, but I walked past the fucking guy, uh, right past the Barclays Center, and it's a guy on FaceTime with someone describing the like layout of like where the police are, how to get into the building. He's like clearly just being like, "Yep, entrances are right here, and there's police over there, and usually the subway's right here." And he's just he's describing it in one of those like, "If you see something, say something" ways, right? Where it's like. This guy's being like real fucking descriptive of the layout of the Barclays Center. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which if you were a terrorist, wouldn't be a terrible target. Right. Right? And the guy was of a brown descent. And there's that moment where you where it's like, see something, say something, combated with, oh, but then am I just being racial profiling? Racial profiling. Yeah. And he didn't do shit about it. So now if the Barclays Center gets fucking struck, I'm you know what I mean? Like, whoops. But so you don't. It's it's crazy. Like you don't. In those moments, you're like, "What's the right thing to do here? Like, be vigilant or be human?" And you don't. You don't just choose human, I guess. But like, it's a you know that kind of shit all the time. Rarely ever does it have to do with race with me. For me, it's always temperament. For me, it's like if someone just has a shitty. If someone doesn't change from like a resting angry face for long enough, I start to be like, "Hmm, right? What's, what's that person's thing?" Maybe like, what? Hmm. You ever see that Bruce Willis, Samuel Jackson, M Night Shyamalan movie called Unbreakable? No. It was the second of the M Night Shyamalan movie. Most of his movies have been garbage. Uh, his first two were good. The Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense was amazing. And then Unbreakable. I like Unbreakable better actually. Um, but that Bruce Willis, one of his superpowers is he can't be broken or. He's unbreakable, right? But also, but he can drown. That's his one weakness. But um, but he <laughs> like also the five Chinese brothers story. Yeah, but also if he makes contact with someone, he gets like a brief glimpse into what they've done, like uh. into like 
anything negative that they've done, he can see it for a second. Yeah. And God, I wish. Sometimes I think I have that, but it's not true. I can just make up. Right, you, negative have, shit. you have the projected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have like worst the, case scenario, yeah. totally in your head version. Yeah, so it's so yeah, I I do read people a lot, but unfortunately, a lot of times it jumps right to like the negative. But I just think that has to do with fucking media and society and just how we're all kind of force fed the negativity and just not enough positivity. I'm going to yeah. I'm going to say that I don't think that's where it stems from from you. No? What do you think? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But um I feel like I feel like that's in your physiology. Like I think you have a, a degree of sensitivity to you. Sure. That goes way back you know like i think it's a survival thing in your family i don't Could know be. what your life was like but you said you know you well, said i mean i was i was never mole i mean i have a good family never you know i've been, I've been like beaten up and yeah, humiliated a right. lot you know what i mean that's, like, that was what I said. as a kid I, yeah, you know but yeah. like not by anyone who was dear to me <laughs> you know just by fucking shitheads you grow up with in southeastern louisiana you know yeah yeah well maybe that's where it comes from i mean it may not come from your uh, you know. I do actually, now that you say that, there was this, like, something that will haunt me for the rest of my life, and it's fucked, it's it's a real fuck situation, but, like, when I was 12, was I tw yeah, yeah, no, I was 12, my cousin was also 12, um, and, like, we were with two friends, we were in Chalmette, Louisiana, there was, there was this wooded area, we were riding our bikes and we saw four other kids and they had fireworks and they were just like, and so like I rode my bike over to them and just being like, hey, kids with fireworks, like right. we're 12. Life is innocent. And as soon as I got over there, they started fucking with me. Just being like, fuck you, pussy. And they were, they were like a little older, but they were also, you know, white, they were fucking white trash, all of them. But they started like throwing bottle rockets at me and fucking with me. So I like quickly rode my bike back you know, the hundred feet or so to where my friends were. And I was like, I don't know about those guys. And before we know it, they're now descending upon us. Right. right. And now there's, there's four of them and the four of us. And we, like, my friends were like, my, the two of them that were my, my, we were like fucking not nerdy, but not like tough kids. Right. Just sort of like, Hey, but my cousin who was with us was like a true badass. He was like a, and so these guys start fucking with us. And my cousin like stands up to them all and he's like no fuck y'all man like what do we we didn't do anything like we're not doing shit to y'all fuck off and they jump him and like the three of us are frozen by fear like we don't do shit about it right we're just too scared of the whole situation and so i watched my cousin get the shit kicked out of him and like they, nothing happened to us those dudes like beat shit out of my cousin and then we're clearly like Fuck you, pussies. Right. You know, and then like then took my bike because it was the nicest one and left. Whew. Like, yeah, just stole my bike. Just, like left me there with a beat up cousin, no bike. And then two friends who immediately were like, we got to go and like left. So it was just me and my cousin. And he wasn't like, like, you know, he didn't have broken bones or anything, right. but like, you know, busted eye, fucking bloody lip. And it just gotten the shit kicked out of him. Yeah. It was busted up. And I like walked with him and his bike back to his his house and his parents and his older brother just came down on me hard. But it wasn't like a, oh man, are you okay understanding thing? It was a, like a, what the fuck's wrong with you? Why didn't you do anything? It's kind of shit. And it was just like, I'm just, and I couldn't explain to him. Like I was terrified. Right. I just didn't say anything. And that sect of my family and my family kind of never healed from that. Wow. Like the, my, they always blamed me for letting JW get beat up, and my parents always kind of blamed them for being assholes. And you know, I was twelve, it's a fucking child. Yeah. By all, so I look back on that. I got that's something like every year I have like time dwelling in that thought, you know? Right. Because it's one of it's one of those like, you know, if you you ever you ever see like. You see those movies like Minority Report had this or like where people can like tap into like you can go back and relive shit. Right. My my futuristic if they could tap into my brain and be like, go back and 
bone any girl you want to bone again mine would be like no can i go back to that undo that moment and undo it like yeah. can i go back and g like give me like super human strength and let me like fuck these kids up like i don't know where those kids are in life i don't know their names i never got there and i know nothing of those four human beings but i guarantee if i saw either one of them ever again and we're talking tw 25 years ago right. i would recognize them immediately it, like their faces are all burnt into my memory mm. from just like how horrified I was of these kids who for no reason decided to just, but you know, what were they going through? That's another thing. It's like, maybe they, they probably all, maybe they were all sexually molested. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. May, I hope they were. Well, they, you know I mean? <laughs> they, they weren't likely from, you know, loving supportive homes. Where, no, you they know, were definitely, whether they won or lost yeah. the soccer game, they were made to feel like exactly. they had accomplished something. Yeah, it's one of those things where you're like, yeah, you know, you guys probably all had abusive dads, and I, I, and good, because fuck you, <laughs> but not really, yeah. not really, but you know well, what I mean, like, I mean, yeah. So, but I, I look back on that has like uh, where I think a lot of my like suspiciousness of everyone comes from, because those that that I traced that moment in my life to the day my innocence was done with, to the uh -huh. day it no longer existed for me, to the day where I can think of like year after year after that like i was always a little more afraid of shit i was always way more skeptical of things you know and and like I, but like you know i approached those kids being like oh they're just like me and us right but they got fireworks cool right maybe they'll share and want to <laughs> hang out nope they'll throw them at us and yeah god i remember, like i still like still to this day bottle rockets like i'm not afraid of fireworks by any means i love them but every time I've, I mean, New Year's just happened, and I was in Louisiana for it. Fireworks are legal there. But even then, picking up a bottle rocket, you have that like flash moment. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, of like remembering what it's like to have a bottle rocket shot at you or thrown at you. Roman candle too. They were, but anyway. Wow. Yeah. So okay, look at that. We had like if this was a therapy session, that'd have been like a breakthrough. <laughs> right there, like oh shit, that's where that comes from, huh? No shit. Anyway, now I want to find those guys, but... Pfft. And what would you do if you found them? Like, talk this out. Yeah. Be like, let's sit down, you four fucks. If you're, if you're all four of you are still alive or not in jail yeah. or dead, you know, or, or I already said that. But, like, I would love to do that. I would love to sit down and be like, I mean, what is that? How does that make you guys feel? Because I don't know how old they were. Right. I assume they were all same age, maybe maybe 14 they were definitely a little older, right. but like I would love to be like, well, how does that make you feel now, men in your late thirties, early forties? Like that, you your fucking... cousin was probably just one of many people they've been exactly. Shit out of. They like, probably don't even, even, even remember it. Yeah, yeah. they probably wouldn't even remember. You know, it's like and they took my fucking bike. Those sons of fucks. Red. It was a red line too. It was a nice bike. Oh yeah, I they remember red took line. It. They nice just BMX took it. bike. Yeah, a guy just liked it and he fucking just took it. And I remember, I remember watching him ride away, holding it by the handle. Two things happened in that moment. One, like. There goes my bike that I fucking loved. And also, hmm, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's a pretty good rider. Oh, that's pretty interesting that you can ride a bike <laughs> and then just kind of hold the and steer the, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucker. Uh, I had a, I would love it if he still had that red line because that's how he got to and from his dishwashing job every day. That fuck. <laughs> You're probably not far off, man, if it's, know, if it's any know. consolation. Yeah. But then again, like, this is another thing. My co And this my cousin, JW, like, I don't know what his life's really like. We don't really, I, like I said, like, that side of my family and I never really mended. Um, I, I don't know what he does. I really don't know shit about him. I know he lives in, I think he lives in Ponchatoula, Mississippi, I think. But, like, I look at, like, the other two kids who were in involved in that. Like, I just stopped talking to them just because distance and time and i went to a different high school and shit but like i've i'm I'm still facebook friends with those guys oh, okay well not still like we just found each other over yeah. the years and they're pretty well they're I, you know well adjusted so i don't know at least none of us like went the wrong way because that sort of shit happens to people and they go the wrong way right they become like bullies or like drug addicts or like you know the pain is you're, it's implanted you as a kid and you're never able to vent it and it just overcomes you and you develop a fucking Oxycontin addiction. You know? That's where that that's where that kind of stuff stems from. Well, it goes you somewhere. Know? I mean, it's, yeah. I bet it's gone somewhere in you. Yeah, it's gone into like a constant, you know, like, hmm, what's that? why does that guy keep walking behind me? 
Yeah. What's he up to? You know, a paranoia that I sort of can't shake, but that I also it doesn't ruin my life. You know what I mean? Like, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't imagine it ruins your life, but no. Is there like a? It does add to my. It's one of the OCD seeds planted in my life for sure. Yeah. You know, for sure. But that's you know, yeah. Because I guess I wonder I, if, of that school of of psychology or psychiatry, like, is it that we all have the we all have a men, mental ailments in us and it's just certain events that bring it out or are you inherently you know what i'm saying like yeah yeah or are you or like because i you know diagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder started seeing a therapist when i was in high school and like I, I i still you know i think therapy and and yoga i'm sorry therapy and meditation should be mandatory i partake in both and they fucking are amazing but like was I always, did I, you know, if, if certain events wouldn't have happened to me in life, would I not have succumbed to the disorder or did the disorder come because of these certain events? And it was just kind of always in me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure with certain disorders, like, you know, or actual ailments or ailments, like, you know, bipolar disorder, I mean, illnesses like bipolar disorder or like, you know, you know, schizophrenia or like multiple personality disorder. I'm sure those are a different story. You know, and those are, it's awful if that's, you have that and I hope you're okay. But like, but then you think of like the milder spectrum of ailments like depression, anxiety disorder, you know, OCD or, uh, and there's so many diff, there's such a spectrum of OCD. It's hard to even, you know, I mean, total sanity is still kind of has little ornaments of ailments all over it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like you look at total, you look at sanity like a Christmas tree, and then each ornament's like a little, a little, a little bit of tick, crazy, a little bit of crazy, you know. <laughs> and we all got that, you know. And but I just wonder, like, you know, there's some people's, do they? Do some people have more lights because they've hung. I don't know. It's just, you see what I'm saying? Am I making any sense? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. totally. I just wonder. I don't, I don't know the answer at all. I'm not a. I can offer you a thought around it. Please do. Um. So I think. First of all, I think there are some kinds of things like if they happen to you, they tend to manifest in certain ways. Sure. So like my ex is she works with a lot of uh, at risk youth. And she said, you know, if a kid is smearing feces all over his room, there's usually sexual abuse going on. Really? Like, OK, you know, so there is, you know, there wow. are there are some signs that typically betray a particular kind of event. Right. Okay. okay. So okay. so there's that. But what you're asking about, if I understand you correctly, um, is something a little different. It's a little bit like a dormant quality and then what does it take to awaken it? And Yeah, exactly. And so I think that, you know, you know, we're all imperfect in different ways and and for sure, you know, genetically and culturally and uh, environmentally, we're predisposed right. to s- different conditions, and then put under enough stress, we're gonna kind of break at our weakest link. And if our weakest link is that particular ailment, in your right. case, let's say OCD, just for conversation's sake, sure, you know, you get put under enough pressure, that's how it manifests. So that, you know, that might have been the thing that was most lively in you for right. whatever reason. I don't know where it comes from. Um, you know, and then also this, but I, you know, we, and this can, we got into this talking about this sort of protective device you have where you sort of analyze your environment, you know, pretty quickly, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, cause you were really trusting up until the point that that trust got violated pretty severely and the yeah. consequences were yeah. not insignificant either. I mean, you lost sure. your cousin, your family's split up, like, you know, that's, that's not small. No, it really isn't, but it just kind of got swept and I don't want to say swept under the rug. It just kind of became like it was also like, I, I you know, my mom and his mom never got along that well anyway. So it was almost like it wasn't all because of that right. event, but that event was definitely the pound of straw that f- paralyzed the camel. You know, yeah, yeah. Like it was the, what was needed to like, all right, now we're just yeah. you're not hanging out with them anymore. You're not sleeping over there anymore. He's not doing it, it anyway. But like. Yeah, so because I, I feel like certain, like I say, in certain like severe mental illnesses, like the schizophrenia, like mania, you right. know, I have a friend, he's a comedian, 
he's talked about on podcasts, but he's manic, and it's unfortunate because, like, under stress, he will have episodes. But he will also, he's also strong enough to fight his way out of the episodes, and he he's overcome it so many times that, like, it kind of gives you hope in the layout of the human brain. Right. You know? But then, like, I feel like, uh, like, you know, you meet people who, like, act as if they're totally sane and totally, they don't have any, like, I don't like the whole concept of, like, normalcy, because it doesn't exist. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and the whole, like, oh, I, that's, I don't, oh, what, you can't just be a human being? Yeah, I am being a human being, and we're all fucking flawed. Right. You gotta accept that. And, like, you could be totally sane, but totally sane, like I was saying earlier, still means a little crazy. Right. We're all part of it. And, like, to wrap it full circle here, just so I have a point, I'm sorry, because I ramble a lot. Like, that's, people ask, like, why do you, if I, at one time, I just one time had a dude ask, why do I do stand up? What is your, what's your ultimate goal? And mine is like to expose my own flaw and my own flaw. I'm just going to use that word again because we all have it and it's beautiful. And I feel like if people can laugh at my flaw, then they can accept theirs a little easier as well. Mm. So it's like expose and relish, expose, embrace, and celebrate the beauty that is human flaw. You know? But at the same time, that's hard for some people. Some people, like, build their entire lives and their entire persona around, like, nope, I'm fucking awesome. Like, maybe you are, but you're also fucked up. Yeah. We're all fucked up. It's yeah. in there somewhere. Yeah, the uh, yeah the fucking awesome people are the ones who have so many lights you can't see the ornaments. Yeah, you know they're just trying to. I mean, everyone sees the ornaments, but they yeah, think if yeah. they put enough lights on the tree, exactly, no yeah. one will, no one will see the ornaments. And and they cover up. There's so many lights you can't even see the tree anymore. Right. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. You know? yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. Wait, where's the tree? That's the beautiful part. Right. I don't give a shit really about the light. It's not the you can hang Christmas lights and ornaments all fucking year round, but it's the tree, right, that makes it special, and that's our humanity. That's who right. we are. You know, you want that smell. You want to smell that tree. You want to water that tree, you know? You want to fucking throw it out on the curb or burn it when it no longer suits you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And to cremate that tree. Yeah, you got to get rid of that tree. God, that was always a thing uh, I liked doing. It, where I, in fucking years ago as a kid, there was just once a year in New Orleans. Well, not once a year. It's, well, it still happens. It's New Year's Eve. There's a big bonfire in Mid-City where it's everyone's Christmas tree. Right. Okay. So it's just hundreds of people just bring their Christmas tree. And, oh, they just throw it in. That's and awesome. This, yeah. And it's this massive bonfire. And I don't, actually don't think they do it uh, like that. I think now it's more regulated by the police. But for years, it was just like a straight up like mid city bonfire. That's cool. And people just hanging out with drinks and throwing Christmas. And people showing up late with like, oh, sorry, Christmas tree. Uh, bonfires are pretty cool. But so are uh, non bonfire situations. Peace. Anyway, I don't know what the fuck I was. Do you feel like? Are you doing all right? Are yeah. You, are you answer? Are you good? Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you? Uh, do you feel like as a comic? You know. You talked about how. You like to expose your flaws, help other people, to maybe inspire people to you know, make friends with their flaws. Yeah. I mean. Is it about healing them, or is it about heal? Do you feel like you get healed? In oh, the it's process? simultaneous. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's just, it's mutual. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Well, it's like yeah, I think like anything. You know, if we all accepted flaw, there'd be a lot less discrimination across the board. You know, from right. race to religion to sex to gender, all it would if we all just accepted. That's that, that that's kind of like what my one issue with the conservative mindset is is like. You're talking about preserving something that isn't real, that is a construct, that is a false idea, like the family values. It's like, but that's your family values. Families are different everywhere you go, you know? Yeah, at the core, there's a similarity, but like, you know, you, a lot of conservatives subscribe to the fucking straight man, straight woman, uh, one one race a certain amount of kids raised under a certain religious umbrella, and that's it. Right. And it's like, well, that's not right. 
That is wrong. That is false. That isn't how it's supposed to be. And I don't, I don't like it. And, but I feel like there's a flaw in those people that they won't accept. They won't embrace. They right. hate homosexuality because maybe they're curious. Right. And they hate that about themselves because they were taught it was a sin. Um, they're racist because deep down inside they identify more with they're a white guy from the hills. You, did you did you see that Saturday Night Live sketch with Tom Hanks, the Black Jeopardy? No. You didn't see that? No. Dude, I, watch it. it. Yeah. It's fucking brilliant because all it 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 does what it does is it shows the similarity between fucking rednecks and poor black people. How similar they truly are. But yeah. how much they hate each other, but how similar they truly are. And it's the truth, man. Like there's so many similarities. You grew up in the fucking mountains of West Virginia or the ghettos of South Side Chicago. There's probably a lot more you guys have in common. You know, there's more. I think there's more class commonalities than there are racial differences. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? I actually one of the observations I've had living here is because Asheville is so white, but it has lots of black people. They just. You don't see them unless you're unless yeah. you try to, you know, yeah. there's only a few that kind of cross over into the white world here. And where you do see them yeah. is you, you I, the only time I've seen, you know, interracial couples around here is when I'm outside the courthouse. Yeah. And they're so it's like it's a social class thing. You see it a lot more. Now, what are you doing out there? Busking? Busking for change? Yeah. Doing comedy <laughs> on the corner. Like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Usually get my business license renewed because I'm, you know, a lake. I'm a smooth. Oh, as a that's lake. right. Smooth like a lake you with know. a business license. Um. Yeah. It's all in the same. It's all in the literally the same parking lot. You know. And you just see. And you see. And you know the yeah. courthouse is right next to the deeds office. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so I've noticed that you know there's a lot of I see a lot more interracial relationships in the poorer class that you're talking about. Yeah. You know. And and so I I found that kind of interesting, um, but I think it's because they don't have these constraints put on them by their by the generation before them. They don't have this like bullshit sort of like you're you need to uphold th- this family name or this. It's like no, you're there. There, I think poor people are more human because mm. it's all they got. Is who they are as yeah. a person. That's like the biggest thing they have. So I feel like they, they don't look. They, they're not as. That's why you. That's why you don't meet that many. I mean, but you're right. Like the, you know, it's it's not. I mean, fuck, man. Like, I th- I think of like, when you talk to when I earlier this or earlier last year, where I was meeting, you know, when I on the road, I I I I I, I, I was a big Bernie guy. And I and I am of the belief that Bernie Def- Sanders would have defeated uh, Donald Trump, and it has nothing. And I was not a Hillary hater, and I don't fucking hate women. I hate I hate that. I hate that accusation that because you didn't support Hillary, you weren't you hated women. It's like no, fuck off. Hillary is she just didn't inspire. Yeah, that's what it is. Terrible I'm sorry. candidate. Just you know. I think but, she actually. My theory is she would have been a good president, but she was an awful yeah. candidate. Yeah. No, I agree. She you know. probably would be an excellent president, but now she apparently is running for mayor of New York, which is interesting. And I hope she wins. I'll vote for her. I live there. But um, so she can move. Yeah. So she can tear apart Trump's exactly. building. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So she can kick his family out of the and make him go live in the fucking White House. <laughs> uh, yeah. Force him to live in the you White House. To go you live wanted in... it. Yeah. But like, I um, you know, you talk to a lot of people. A lot of the anti-Bernie people were like anti-socialism. And it was it's hilarious because it's how in, uninformed people are. It's like you'd be better you, person making fifty thousand dollars a year before taxes, would be better off under socialism. Right. You just don't understand what it is, and you equate it to communism. But it's not. You know, it's they're not they're they're similar, but they're fucking worlds apart at the same time. You know. Well, communism is a political structure. Socialism is an economic Social structure. structure. Yeah, it's they the... just happen to go together in yeah. in Russia, but they're not. There's no. zero in common between no. communism and socialism. Well, it's also like I don't think the Republican Party or the Republican system, politically as or socially, is a bad system. It just unfortunately attracts conservatives and that mindset more than it does because it doesn't 
really have a window open for people who don't want to be rich, who just want to be happy. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't think the idea of like smaller government, less government programs is necessarily bad. I'm not, I don't ever vote Republican. I just, when you look at it, it's like, this isn't a terrible idea as far as financially and what the, it's not, it's a little, it's a little more ab about American freedom, you know? Right. But unfortunately it's controlled by fucking rich white people. But that was the thing I came across time and time again was like second generation rich kids firing off phrases like, well, I just don't want to pay. I don't want my money paying for that. I didn't earn. It's like you didn't. Yeah. It's not your money. It never will be. What the fuck have you done? And I'm very vocal about that shit to their faces. Yeah. I will humiliate a 25 year old rich person. I will fucking go out of my way to ruin their night because yeah, it's, I'm being a dickhead, but I think I'm also making points. And I think they need to feel that. I think they need to feel it and maybe think about it and be like, maybe that guy was right. But I also try and do it in a chill way yeah. because that's a problem I have, too, is where like on Twitter or on social media, everybody just wants to point out how stupid the other side is. And it's like, well, of course, we're not going to make any progress there. Because right. we're constantly telling Trump supporters how stupid and racist they are. Of course, they're not just going to be like, oh, really? Uh, maybe, You're right. Maybe I, I am yeah. stupid and racist. <laughs> Let me open up to your opinion. Right. Like, you can't do that. You've got to. I'll never do that when I yell at. When I've when I have had these moments where I like argue with some 25 year old trust fund kid, I never call them ignorant or stupid. I just try and illustrate how like they don't understand what they're talking about because they grew up under a shelter. They grew up with a golden ticket. They don't ever know what adversity is like unless it's someone like me. And even that's not the right way. There's probably a better way to do that than what I do. But at least I'll admit I was wrong. But I feel like there needs to come, you know, we need to have a conversation. And it's not happening. And that's what's fucking scary. But it's also this, like, roast culture that we're in. Where it's like, ooh, who's got the best fucking... It's all about, bam, getting a good line in. And then it's like, yeah, what? But then what? You know? You, oh, yeah, that witty insult, well-constructed. Right. But now what? Right. It's you know not moving I mean? the conversation forward. And now just people are getting angrier and angrier. And it's like, you know, because truthfully, I feel bad for Trump supporters worse than I feel for people on this side. Because, yeah, OK, our candidate didn't win. Who gives a fuck? We're over that. I feel worse for Trump supporters when in two years they realized he never gave a shit about them. And they're not going to get they're not going to be back. Right. They're still going to be disenfranchised poor people whose jobs got shipped probably now to Russia. <laughs> they're not going to China anymore. Now they're going to Russia. Like it's, he's not going to fix you. He's not going to fix your life. He's not going to, Trump's not anti-gay racist. He's not. Trump's from, he's from fucking Queens. Right. You know what I mean? Like I think he just, uh, he, he never came out as like anti-gay marriage or racist or any of that shit. He just side, you know, we all know the story. He just let the supporters believe that he backed them. Hey, I don't look, I ain't going to come out and say I hate black people, but I know you do. And hey, I got your back. That's right. what he basically did because he didn't. He, he doesn't. Hate, he's not. He's not. I don't think Trump's a bigot. I just think he's a fucking moron who didn't want to be president and now is president. But I, I am of the mindset of like, hey, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And be like, all right, man, you're there now. Make some good shit happen. But I don't think he wanted to get this far. And I, I think know, now did he's sort see, of like, did you fuck. see his first press conference or even read about Dude, it? Dude, it's anything? yeah. I, I watched. I watched a little bit of it, but I read about it. It was like, so he's just that's going to be it for the next four years. I mean, you can't. Where he just pitches that way. a fit. Where he just pitches a fit, and and no, and he only takes. He's, you're not. No one's allowed to ask him a challenging question. I mean, yeah. you know, I just he is such the antithesis of obama in my mind i mean we're just we've we've just had the most i mean he's even the antithesis dude he might even be the antithesis of george w fucking bush george bush would at least get on stage during press conferences and take it yeah and mispronounce the shit out of everything and stumble <laughs> but he would stand on the stage yeah. and take it yeah he and he would get he would go out he would march himself out in front of his fucking critics which was most of the country and fire away he would take it you know what i mean like at least he stood up to his own at least he fucking 
I don't know. It's like that's what I worry about with Trump, where he's just gonna hide and whine and tweet. Yeah. And tweet. Which also I also don't believe that's him tweeting. I think those are staffers. I don't think he has time to actually sit down and fucking tweet. You know what I mean? I don't know, man. Maybe, but it's like or maybe I there's, need to believe it's there's a staffers. there's a flavor to it that I know yeah it's all kind that's of, pretty does, consistent with, yeah. with the way he behaves at press conferences and on stage. I mean, he just he's it's I think it probably is him. You know, uh, Jesus Christ! I just want to believe it's I want to believe it's staffers. But I mean, I also feel like this might be like the GOP's final stand. Like they backed, they really backed the wrong fucking guy, and there's going to become such a divide in them in the next few years that by the time we get around to another election, they don't have a chance. They don't even have a full a party. I mean, that's very I my opinion and, on that. I've know, heard a lot of people say similar things. I think it's optimistic. My experience of the Republicans, and I'm not one, is uh, it's party first, humanity yeah. second. Oh and yeah, yeah. They because they've done a really good job. They, they didn't want Trump. They were divided all the way oh, up yeah. until the election. Yeah. But they all when it, when push came to shove, they all voted for him. Yeah. And you know they all went to Trump Tower and met with him. Even Mitt Romney, who spent you know months saying don't ha don't elect Trump. Yeah. And he still showed up for a meeting. Yeah. You know it's it's, I think there's a level of you know, good old boys club that goes on that you and I can't even fathom. You want to talk about a long con, man? I, oh, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I'm not, I don't have it in me to figure it out. Like, it's way too much for me, you know? Yeah. And I had this one fantasy that when Obama and Trump were sitting there in the room together, yeah. you know, and when, the, like, the day after the election, and it was supposed to be a 15 minute meeting and ended up being like two hours and they spent a lot of time alone together. I have I have this weird fantasy of Obama being like, well, here's who you really work for. Yeah, and here, yeah. here's the real situation. Yeah. You know, I got in it just like you to create change. But you know what? Yeah. Let me introduce you to the Rothschilds. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, here's the Koch brothers. Yeah. Here's yeah. here. You well, I mean. I mean, yeah, even deeper than that. Well, yeah. much deeper than the Koch brothers because they're just republic. They just fund Republican, but the Rothschilds yeah. run the world. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I I think we have no idea, you know, and and oh, of course not, yeah. Um, and I I think you know a friend of mine recently he he impacted me when he said this. He's you know I I'm not gonna do what he does. He doesn't vote. He doesn't pay tax. He doesn't do a lot of things. But you know he said, you know it's a bigger discussion than this, but. You know, I don't even think the votes are counted and I don't even think it matters. I think the people who really I think there's people at the tippy tippy top who benefit and they will just alter their plan based on who wins the election. But it doesn't really matter because they're really just serving themselves in a very profound way. And and there's you know, the the wealth funnels into a very small yeah. number of pockets at the end of the day. And, you know. He feels like that's just he. They don't care who wins as long as we are fighting about it. Yeah. Like this is what they want. They want yeah. us ba battling with one another, disagreeing with one another. So we're distracted, right? And we don't see what they're really doing, so that they, you know, their five families can live well. Yeah. The thing that trips me out about that is that, like, how can they? What is it that they think they're going to get away with? Like, if there's a nuclear war, they're going down too. You Unless know? there's like some, you know, fucking Greenland compound that we don't know about, you know? Even if there is, do they yeah. want to live on this planet in a nuclear winter in fucking Greenland? I mean, yeah. it's it's... Like what? What are they? What game are they playing? Like what are they trying to win? Like I, to maybe me, the, maybe they don't know. Maybe maybe they like yeah. Maybe they're in control, but maybe like the rest of us, they just don't know. So they're just hoping. Oh, let's just you know, let's just keep the threat of the nuclear war out there so that everybody s stays in line, but at the same time keeps arguing so that we keep, you know, so that they keeping the money well. and we can keep fucking owning entire countries. And just see just, where that goes. I just don't get it. Like, 
it's not how I want to spend my life. Like I that one of the things for me about getting into comedy is and and this podcast is a huge part of it. This is how I want to spend my time. I love writing, I love performing, and I love having these kinds of conversations with people. And if right. those were the things I was doing with my time, plus my daughter and mountain biking, you know, like I would feel like I have a very full life. Like I'm fascinated by this planet. I'm fascinated by people. I like going inside and then coming out and talking about it. And of course, you know, it's all about, there's also the high you get from the laughter and everything that, you know, the other pieces of it that are attractive to us as comedians. But, right. but I'm talking about, it's about the quality of the life that I want, the way I want to spend my time, what fills and feeds my soul. Right. That's what I want to do. And that, for me, requires a very diverse, complicated, and interesting world. And I can't imagine making my life about something where my I'll be fine if all this stuff around me is destroyed and I live in a bunker in Greenland. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think, I hope that's not, there isn't that. I just really do think that, like, they are human too and they don't fucking know. I mean, they know way more than we do, but they also, that also means that they are fucking trying to keep, you know, maybe it's it's all about just keeping the masses separate, confused, fighting, and purchasing things. Yeah. You know? And buying bug out bags and guns and, you know, I mean, part of the, I think the NRA is, I think the NRA is the NRA because of how much kickback, how much money those Rothschilds and top percentage make off of gun sales. You know? Right. Yeah. If they're like what you say, they've got if they're basically the mafia and like the mafia, they have a piece of everything on the planet. Well, they own the banks. Yeah. Exactly. And the banks So they own all the money. They own a ba apparently I saw this on the internet. Yeah. Apparently they they own like every country has its national bank and right. they own the national banks up until ten years ago or fifteen years ago, they o they owned the national banks for every country except Iraq and Libya, and North Korea, and Syria, and Iran. Now they own Iraq. Jesus. Now they own Syria. Now they own Libya. And the only two left are um, Iran, and they may, they may own Iran already. I think, the I think the only one left they said is that they don't own is North Korea. Wow. Which means that's where we're going next. If you follow, if, if this is true, mm -hmm. and I don't, I have no way of knowing for sure if it is, but let's pretend it is. You follow, remember in, uh, you follow the money, the money, and, and you follow the, the in, our, in this case, you follow the trail of wars. Yeah. So if you look where the wars have been, those have been the countries where evidently the Rothschilds don't own the banks yet. Right. But there, so we went into Iraq, then they, then they, then they were able to take over that bank. We're all wondering why we're in Syria. Why is Syria suddenly yeah. a hotbed of activity? Apparently, because of the bank. Yeah. Like, I don't know if, I mean, I would love to know if that's really true. Because if it is, it's frightening in a way that's that's uh, almost like infinite. You know, it's it's almost as hard for me to fathom as what it might actually be like to be God. Like, yeah, I, I don't know, you know. It like makes you wish we lived in a world where the evil was just a fucking guy with an eye patch. Yeah. Cackling about destroying the world from you know, it's like you wish it was just some something like that where it was like a pure like it's like, oh, that can be destroyed, where it's like there's probably some like eight year old Rothschild kid who has no idea that his parent like no clue yeah. what yeah. he's a part of, but he's gonna be raised to be that exact same thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like going to be explained to him that sometimes daddy has to make a phone call and millions of people in a country over years have to be wiped out so that, you know, because we need our daddy needs his green, his green, green. Daddy needs a green, green. And you need his green, green, too. You need your green, green. So you can have your toys and you can have your catapult and your trampoline park and your under and your underground fun lair like. And your and your little, little you like your little helicopter, you like your little hoverboard. Well, then Daddy needs to make a phone call so that the 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 gun gun the pow pow men go shoot up a bunch 
of civilians and strangers so that daddy can get his green green. Daddy needs more green green. You know, like that's that's what happens. Like that daddy needs his fucking green green. And they're gonna go get that they're gonna get that green green. Shit. Anyway. It's four thirty. I think that's perfect, man. Yeah. I love it. I like that you did you just make all that up right now? Yeah. Okay. Um I just want to say, Sean, uh, I really, I'm, I'm going to be following what you're doing Thank for you. a long time. Thank you very I much. Am, uh, I'm so blown away by your brain and and well, how you. you think and and how you wrap these stories together. You know, um. When you performed at the auditorium and you just did like a 10 or 15 minute set, you just fucking, I mean, you you just upended the room. And and it was great. For me, it was like, you know, I would have even been fine going right after you, but I know I would have had a shittier set than going four comedians later or whatever ended up happening. Right. Like poor Ryan who did go after you. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, it just, it watching... And especially like up close in a room, you know, the, the worst seat is sixth row. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah, yeah. like so being in an intimate surrounding with someone who's, you know, taken this craft to the level that you have. And I know you're still growing and emerging. And I know that you don't. I'm confident that you don't feel like you've arrived. Oh, fuck no. Yeah. I don't um, think it's always about the, it's the journey. It's like, do you ever like, yeah. But yeah, do you ever? But even yeah. even like in the way that you know the Louis and the Chris Rocks have have arrived, my guess is you know you still oh no see I, that as down the road, yeah. and and even that like just being able to uh, watch you perform in that intimate setting on that same stage where me and every other you know aspiring open micer go to kind of work out our shit. Um, it was really cool. I mean, it was really, it was really special and thank you. And it was really inspiring and it was really generous of you. Like that was a piece of it too. I'm like, this guy is such a comedian. He's not here cashing a check, you know, oh. he's not an ash. He's not only willing to go on stage when he's getting paid. He's, oh, he'll no. do 10 yeah. minutes at the auditorium and tonight you're going to go to pulp and, yeah. you know, and do a set there at some point and, Ruin the night for some comedians there too, and <laughs> and uh, no, I'm kidding. I mean, well, it was, the the benefit of of watching you perform far outweighed the having to follow that. You oh, know? well, thanks, man. That's and, awesome. And uh, so I just want you to know that, and I and I really, I'm really grateful for this couple hours that we've gotten to hang out. I it's been it's, I I loved having a conversation with you. It was great. And um, so I just can't wait to see what you do next, man. Well, thank you. I hope it's sooner than later. Well, I hope it's sooner and later. I hope it's sooner and later, and and that we make a bunch of green green doing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to Sean was incredible for me. I think I was a little starstruck at first, but by the end I felt like I could speak to him as a brother. Hopefully life will put us on the same stage again soon, because that will mean I'll have really made it as a comedian. If you like what you heard, please visit our website. Use our Amazon portal and rate us on iTunes. Make sure you tell your friends about us, and if you feel so inclined, please consider making a donation on our donation page. That way, we can keep failing for years.